Hello, everyone, and welcome to True North Project. This is Christian, and this project is equal parts sense making, soul searching, and storytelling. Today, my guest is Bobby Wade. Uh, Bobby is a student of plant medicines, ancestral ceremonies, and indigenous ways of life. He is also a sun dancer, a water protector, a veteran, a father, and a coach. Um, Bobby's also a good friend. I met him in 2018 down in Colombia for my second um, ayahuasca retreat. And this was, you know, a, a, a retreat that I could have never have expected. It was life changing in many, many ways. And I was exposed to indigenous wisdom and, and, and you know, ancestral knowledge that I wasn't even expecting. So it was, um, it was a huge turning point in my life. And ever since then, Bobby and I have been friends and been connected. And I've been down uh, several other times to Colombia and reconnected there. Uh, he's also based out of Australia, where his family is now. And he's doing some amazing work with his project, um, The Way of Life. It's a Substack podcast blog. And he's interviewing um, and sort of creating a space for indigenous wisdom to kind of like a treasure trove of indigenous knowledge. So he's got some amazing conversations with uh, elders and, and different wisdom keepers um, from all over the world. And I highly recommend checking out uh, his substack, The Way of Life. In this conversation, we discuss the sacredness of water, uh, re-indigenizing, stewardship of nature, ancestral wisdom, and rites of passage, among many other things. But this is sort of the core of it. And um, I just wanted to also let you know that Bobby is about to launch a, a deep dive um, course called Rediscovering Ancestral Wisdom in Modern Times. And uh, I highly recommend you check that out. Links in the description. Um, if you're listening to this in October, it's still open. Definitely check it out. And uh, he's basically just like democratizing access to indigenous elders and knowledge that most people have no access to. So definitely something worth considering. And at the very least, check out his sub stack and follow him there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. And I, I, I don't want to ramble on. I want to just like turn you over to, to Bobby Wade and, and to dive into this conversation after a quick uh, word from the sort of sponsors of this project. This podcast is sponsored by Lumi Labs. Lumi makes super high quality, strain specific, organic edibles. And as I like to say, they're edibles for people who don't like edibles. So if you're cannabis curious and you're interested in trying some high quality, that the best quality I've been able to find in the edible world, uh, Lumi would be for you. They have 10 premium strains of organic full spectrum gummies. Uh, they're all, you know, regular Delta 9 THC, so there's no synthetic cannabinoids or no weird types of synthetics like uh, Delta 8 or HHC or any of these other things that you might have heard of. And basically, you get the full complex profile of the plant, including all of the terpenes and all of the minor cannabinoids that normally get left out of edibles when people just extract THC. So the, the, the crazy thing here is that you can actually get these in, in all 50 states legally because of the 2018 Farm Bill. All these gummies are made from hemp derivatives. So basically, it's cannabis, but it's under a certain THC threshold, so it's federally legal. But when they formulate it, you can still create potency with the formulation. And so you end up with 5 milligrams of Delta 9 THC per gummy and 5 milligrams of CBD, minor cannabinoids, and all of the other complex terpenes. And this gives you like sort of targeted benefits and an entourage effect of the entire plant. So it really then becomes about the genetics of the strain and, and the kind of benefits that each strain can give. Um, and you can start to get a much more nuanced and complex experience out of cannabis, especially in the edible world, which is generally just like how much THC are you taking is, is really been the main factor. And now it's evolving and it's getting much more complex and much more um, nuanced and, and much better. These are the best edibles I've ever had. And they're the best cannabis experience I've ever had. Because um, when you take cannabis in edible form, it's processed through differently through the body. And, and I, you know, I personally am not a big fan of smoking. It's just not good for your health and for various reasons. And so this has been a huge game changer for me. 
I can get a, a, a dose that isn't crazy. I can, you know, have a clear headed, awesome experience and I can have a targeted experience depending on what I want to experience. I take a different strain. So there's three different sativas, pina colada kush, orange, orange cream cookies, and Durban Skittles. Durban Skittles is my personal favorite. It allows me to have energy and, and better for creativity. And it also has pining in it, which is a terpene that's great for cognitive function and focus. So not only do I feel great and have energy, but I stay clear headed and focused. So I love doing it for podcasting or writing. Uh, there's three hybrids, sour strawberry cookies, sour caramel apple kush, and watermelon sorbet. These are going to have a range of different effects because you know they include terpenes from the sativa and the indica side of things. So you can have, for example, mood boost, but still relaxing and de-stressing and different combinations like that. For example, with sour strawberry cookies, which is really popular. And then there's three indicas, plumberry runts, cotton candy kush, and granddaddy sour OG. Granddaddy sour is sort of like the, the goat in terms of indica strains. It's really, really good for pain and relaxation and sleep. It's very sedative. It's got uh, three or four different terpenes that are all in that direction of, of indica, sort of indica couch, so to speak, and really good for embodiment, for the float tank, uh, those types of things. And they even have a microdose line for people who want to go even you know, more mild, even though these gummies are only five milligrams of THC and all the strains I just described. The microdose line is even lower at three milligrams of THC, more CBD in that, in that spectrum. And um, it's just a more mild and, and subtle experience for people who want to go into kind of shallow into the pool to begin. Uh, and, you know, don't just take my word for it. There's over 16,000 five-star reviews online. If you check out lumigummies.com, and I'll include the link in the show notes, you can see what other people are saying about their experience uh, with Lumi. It's, a, it's overwhelmingly positive. And it's really cool to see like a company come in and do really like do everything right organic hemp from from small american farmers from the northwest you know the cannabis is grown out under the sun not necessarily under lights in an indoor grow like you would in the desert like here in nevada for example in vegas um and so you're getting also the nano emulsification and the gentle extraction process so you're getting that once again full profile better bioavailability and all the organic crafts shit you know no synthetics, no fillers, no dyes, no bullshit, only organic fruit and good ingredients and, and organic cannabis. And that's, that's all it is. So um, if you want to try Lumi, uh, they'll ship directly to you. Uh, you can use discount, discount code true north to save 20% at checkout, and that will support this project. And um, if you're in St. George or in Southern Utah, uh, I recommend checking true north float out and, and pairing your Lumi experience at true north float um, in a float tank. That's my favorite way to experience them. And we also have um, Lumi there available as well, even though right now we're sort of just like, depending on when you listen to this, we're still in waiting for the approval process for the state of Utah to sell them. So we're just giving them out as free samples for now. So if you want to enjoy that experience and, and, and have a, you know, a free sample on us and you're in Southern Utah, come into True North Float. Um, but otherwise, check out lumigummies.com and the discount code is True North. And that will save you 20% on your order and it'll support this project. And I uh, hope you enjoy and have a nice trip. Much love. This podcast is sponsored by Art Drop. Art Drop is a revolutionary new movement, new company that is liberating art. Um, da Vinci actually spent 16 years meticulously perfecting the Mona Lisa. And just to give you some context of how much things have shifted and changed, uh, in 16 years, AI will have generated a trillion mostly stolen images. Um, most of what AI is gen generative AI is doing is is it's trained on images that are not that are out of that are under copyright that are not you know paying artists, not supporting the artists and the creators who've made the images. So most of what you're seeing in the AI generation space is actually stolen. Um, and AI, in addition to just stealing, is actually polluting culture. So. As much as I'm a you know a fan of certain AI tools, and um, I see the you know the possibility, the positive possibilities with AI, I also see you know massive uh, issues here, and there's essentially a war happening on art and on artists and uh, on culture. 
And so I see that, you know, right now AI is kind of polluting the culture and flooding the space with shit with 34 million, you know, new images every day, um, something like that. And it's growing all the time. And so really it's not just about AI. It's, it's also about art and artists. It's really what art drop stands for is protecting artists and for, um, helping empower artists. So right now, you know, artists are starving for exposure not, and not only, you know, just to sell their art, not only that, when they do sell their art, they're usually selling an original and then they lose out on all the future value of that original painting because now it's no longer theirs. They don't own it anymore. And if they blow up and become famous, then that art becomes extremely valuable and they don't actually own the art anymore. So the person who bought the art of the art collector, the elite, you know, art collect collection sort of industry and the people who are just sort of like siloing and money laundering capital through art, which is really, really kind of dark underbelly <laughs> of what's going on in the, in the art world. Um, they're really the ones profiteering from most of the art industry. There's like $65 billion in industry. Most of that, like 97% of that is originals. It's like really high value original, you know, paintings. And the people who own that and who are profiteering from those paintings are not the artists in general. So what Art Drop aims to do is to is to liberate art and to stand for the artist. And so essentially what we're doing is we're solving the scarcity problem where you've got originals that can they're they're locked up they're they're locked up in scarcity and they're in one location and they're they're not getting as much as ex exposure so you can have an artist who spends months or years creating a painting and they only so many people can see it because it's only in like one place and then in addition to that if they do sell that once again they lose out on the future value of their of all their work so art drops creating the art galaxy like an ecosystem that that connects everything and empowers artists. So we curate and, and put art out in public locations, but we put replica art out there. So we have technology that allows us to scan the painting and actually replicate it with a 3D replica. So it's a textured print that the print looks almost indiscernible from the original. Um, and most artists can't tell the two apart. So you have this like really incredible replication process with this high, high technology. And that goes out into the wild in curating public locations and beautifying the world and getting more exposure for artists. And then each one of those paintings is connected to a gallery tag, which connects the, the painting to the story, the story behind the art and to you know the, the e-commerce store where you can purchase a 3D replica and you can support the artists. And 70% of all of those you know, commissions go to the artists, right? And you know, so we're empowering artists and we're liberating their originals, they get to keep their originals and then the, the streams of revenue that can come in and, 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 and you know, hopefully feed them because <laughs> artists are starving. So uh, that's essentially in a nutshell, what we're doing is we're um, beautifying the world, curating public spaces, connecting the story to the art, and then compensating both the people, the places putting the art out there and the artists who obviously do all of the work in creating it. And, um, that's what Art Drop's all about. You can check out artdrop.me and you can see what we've already got on the, on the, the, sh the shop there. Obviously, we're, it's a startup. There'll be many, many more drops coming and many, many more paint uh, visionary artists and different creators coming online, coming on board. But um, you can totally still order some beautiful replica arts that we have, uh, replica paintings that are available on artdrop.me right now. And if you use to discount code true north you'll save some money on on your order and obviously as every, everything i just described you know that's what you're supporting you're, you're supporting human art and human artists um, as we see the sort of generative wave of artificiality just the tsunami coming to kind of obscure uh everything else that's going on and uh it's a real weird time to be uh, an artist and to be a creator and it's a weird time to be a human right now um, in the age of AI. So, uh, yeah, so support Art Drop, support artists, uh, support an artist, even if it's not through Art Drop, go support an artist. And um, artdrop.me if you want to do that uh, directly and um, have the art, the replica shipped to you. Use code True North at checkout to support this project and to save some money and uh, enjoy. Bobby, my, my man, it's been it's been a minute since we've 
dropped in and connected. So I'm excited to talk to you. And um, I've been sort of on the periphery, tuning in here and there to the Way of Life podcast, which is your project. And every time I do, I'm kind of like, why don't I listen to this more often? Because I seem to get something valuable from it every time. You, you're doing these really amazing deep dives with indigenous elders and different um, wisdom keepers. And it's really, it's really cool to see a project that's got a lot of um, soul to it, a lot of intention to it. And it's also just cool to see like a totally different way of perspective and of seeing the world, you know, it's at first pretty alien to the Western mind. So, you know, and me having said Western mind, having been raised in the U S and stuff to, um, listen to, you know, different elders speaking about different ways of relating to land and to water and to place, you know, and to each other. Um, it just, I think it's really important and valuable given the context of our sort of race to the bottom that we're in um, globally. And mm. especially, you know, with the sort of global economic Moloch like forces that are sort of driving us um, faster and faster towards the cliff. So um, I would love to just pick your brain a little bit about what got you into this, what got you on this journey in terms of why did you want to start? the way of life podcast and, um, you know, tell these stories with these elders and, um, yeah, I just want to start there. Yeah. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. And, uh, thanks for having me on the podcast here. I know it's been, uh, we've been back and forth for a bit, so it's, uh, it's good to finally be here and to be you know, connecting again. And, you know, we've, uh, we've shared some, some good times, um, in different parts of the world together. And, uh, yeah, I think, um, with in, in in regards to the way of life, um, it's a project that came to fruition here in Australia, where I'm currently residing. Um, but I think the story goes back at least you know fifteen or even more fifteen you know seventeen years when um, I you know myself I'm a combat veteran, uh, served in Afghanistan with the Australian Army, and um, at the age of twenty three I. I got out and I just wanted to find um, something. I didn't know what it was exactly, but I needed to find something. And it, it, it led me to be in South America and traveling around South America and led me to to Colombia and led me to uh, plant medicine and where I had my first kind of ceremony. And it was life-changing in the sense of, um, you know, some people tell stories about plant medicine, how, you know, the, the the visions they had were just like the most incredible things in the world or this that, or the other but for me um the 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 feeling that i felt after was like a oneness or like a connection uh, and that led to more discovery with these plants and with different elders and uh, ended up with me living in colombia and starting a retreat center with plant medicine where we we met um so <clears throat> all, all these years of, of working with, with different elders and sitting, you know, like basically in front of them and, and listening and just listening and listening and listening uh, has brought up a lot of valuable things that I can apply into my life on a day-to-day -day basis from ways of being connected, uh, ways of uh, understanding the elements like water, uh, ways of treating, you know, my wife, treating my, my children, like uh, treating the 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 the, the, the the ancestors or the, the let's say here in Australia, like the old people of the land. So it's basically, you know, like years of sitting with these elders and learning all these, these ways of life. And it's something that we're, you know, we've lost along the way in our society. We we're so disconnected right now on so many levels, yet we're so connected on these other, you know, levels like technology, for example, but on a, on a spiritual level, on a, on a physical level, on an ancestral level, we're so disconnected from, from reality. So um, I was here in Australia about two years ago, and I just I actually woke up at two in the morning, and um, there was a voice you know, said to me, you need to start Substack. <laughs> and I was like, okay, like, you know, I'd been talking to a friend a couple of weeks before that about Substack, and I was like, all right, Substack, let's, let's look into that. What, what can I do? Like, what can I offer? 
Uh, and I think it's been a journey of um, self-knowing as well and self-belief and knowing that there, that I can be a bridge to people from Indigenous elders to, you know, let's say the Western world. But being able to offer that bridge and support for people so that they can, um, they can take some, some teaching, you know, whatever it is, some, some word from some elder on the other side of the globe, they can take that and apply that into their day-to-day -day life so that they can be in, at the end of the day, you know, my mission is to re-Indigenize people and to bring people back to like reconnecting with, with our mother earth. Re-Indigenize people. That's a, it's a beautiful term. It's like kind of a sad term in a sense, because it means we've lost it, you know? Um, we've, we really have lost, you know, you know, you know, it's interesting, like, it's so weird that we're having this conversation right now and the, the timing of it, because, um, my wife just got back from an ayahuasca retreat. Um, her, her first, her first retreat, she did it here in the U S and, um, we just had, uh, she brought back some, um, some rose petals and, uh, like a sweet herbal sort of cocktail for a bath. And so we just took a, like a really beautiful herbal bath together with these amazing fragrances and these, you know, kind of, uh, blessed herbs and it just took me right back to Colombia, you know, like to doing, doing retreats down at Eagle Condor Alliance. And it's the reason I'm bringing up ayahuasca is because it wasn't until I went through some really deep, uh, healing and some medicine work, not just with ayahuasca, but, you know the sweat lodge and, uh, the different, the different, um, modalities and in indigenous traditions that it's not just about the substances. It's not just about the, you know, the modality itself. It's about the prayers and the intention and the whole container, the whole context of it, the storylines behind all of it, the wisdom traditions behind all of it. And so when you're saying re-indigenize, unless you've been in something like that or had a, tasted that, it's hard to know what you mean you know like i think a lot of people are wondering what you mean by that and so maybe you could speak to what is the difference between say an indigenous um tradition or culture and a non-indigenous or western or modern or colonial or however you want to label our sort of yeah. you know mainstream societal culture now yeah 100 percent. i think first of all i'd like to clarify a few things when I say re-indigenized because it's, it can be a, <clears throat> a touchy subject for people. And um, in by no means am I, uh, as I've been kind of uh, attacked by people online by putting out you know, certain content around this, like bypassing, spiritually bypassing or doing any of that kind of stuff. And it's not about cultural appropriation. When I say re-indigenize, you know, like I, I sat with elders and I'm a white guy and I'm in Colombia and I'm sitting with, you know, indigenous Colombians in ceremony and they say to me, like, you, you're native, you're, you're native to the earth, you know, like you, you too have a lineage, you too have uh, healers in your, your lineage, you have midwives, you have um, curanderos, you know, like healers with plants or warriors, like ev everyone has that. So when, when, you, when you hear that, there's, a, there's something that, that resonates inside of you, a knowing or an understanding of, okay, like I do come from somewhere. You know, right now where I live in Australia, there's a, there's a huge disconnection that I see in the white population because the, the essence or the, the consciousness of that population comes from a slave or a convict uh, mentality that was brought out here by the British colonialists. And this is no way about um, just bypassing or not worrying about things that have happened to Indigenous people around the world. Um, but it's, it's about being able to recognize that and, and, and create like an inquiry. So when I say re-Indigenize ourselves, it's more about just acknowledging the land, which a lot of people do is they just like acknowledge like, oh, I'm from, I, I'm on this country and that's it. A re-indigenization is understanding that we're all part of, we're all in this together. We're all, we're all part of this, this earth. You know, we come from a lineage. You know, uh, my ancestors are from uh, Ireland and Scotland and, and Scandinavia, and they had ceremonies. They had plant medicines that they used. They had different forms of sweat lodges and 
honoring you know the solstice and the equinox and, and those things so um it's about reconnecting to that as much as possible and at the same time understanding the land where you live so where i live there's places that i shouldn't there's water holes here in australia where i shouldn't go swimming why because ancestrally those water holes were used by indigenous women of these lands to birth children and i, I was at those water holes and um i jumped in the water and i didn't know you know i jumped in and i felt something I felt like uh, like an energy almost like kind of pulling me down and I, I got out of the water pretty quick and my wife's like, well, what's, what's the matter, you know? And there's other people out there swimming and I was like, nah, we shouldn't be here. This is not good, you know? And my kids were super, super still, just kind of like in a meditative state and, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of really active. And my wife's like, like, stop being a pussy, like get in the water. I was like, nah, this, we shouldn't be. And then she jumped in the same thing. She's like, no, nah, there's something going on. So then I was, I was sitting with an indigenous auntie like a couple of weeks later and I asked her, you know, about this and she's like, well, they're the birthing pools, you know, they're for, they're for women. So what you were feeling was that energy. And wh when I got out of the water, I took tobacco out of my, my bag and I, I just said, um, like I asked permission and, you know, if I've done anything wrong here, like I'm just putting tobacco down here to, to make peace with like the spirits of these lands. So th these are kind of things that I've, you know, like that. I've learned through working with indigenous elders, you know, it's, it's an education of how to, how to move through land. You know, other people there are just swimming. They may be not picking up on it or, or aware of it, but there's places out here, there's mountains. I've sat with elders out here. There's mountains where people walk up and they say, don't climb up the mountains and people fall off and the people have died, you know, so it's, it's educating. And I think the difference is, um, to go back to what your, your, your question is, the, the difference between like an indigenous society or indigenous way of seeing life compared to this like colonial is that, you know, um, the indigenous way is more about if I take something, I have to give something. And the, the colonial way is like, I'm just going to take and keep taking and keep taking. So, for example, when I was in those water holes, I jumped in that water, I gave tobacco as an offering. So that's me giving back, you know. So it's just, just these little ways of reconnecting to your environment, understanding the song lines, what's the local language, what, what, where you shouldn't go, where is there like burial sites, is, were people massacred here, understanding the history. So it's, it's a re-indigenization that way. And then maybe there's a self-inquiry of like, well, where do I come from? You know, what's my tradition? What's my history? Yeah so much to go on there and um i love everything you just shared i think that uh i just want to quickly speak to this idea of of you said spirit of the land and and i just was listening to a podcast from josh Shree, and he does the, the emerald podcast have mm -hmm. you ever yeah yeah so it. really really good project he just put one out called guardians and protectors which is all about this idea that there are that nature isn't all the same everywhere. It's like there's so much diversity and there's so much, um, mm -hmm. you know, nature is both nurture. It's both our our sustenance and you know, it's the mother that feeds us, but it's also, you know, Kali the destroyer, right? <laughs> like there's the ability for, um, you know, hardcore. Uh, like the, like the saying goes, nature is metal. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there is, you know, there's uh, so many different examples of that. Like you could be lunch pretty quick for all manner of different things that want to eat you from bacteria all the way to, to apex predators. But, um, you know, we've distanced ourselves from the reality, right, of, of um, surviving in nature, so to speak. We've sort of insulated it in, in our sort of modern society. We've climate controlled all of our domiciles and our cars and everything and so i can be here in las vegas and in the middle of the summer still be comfortable where it should be mostly inhospitable outside mm -hmm. um and then of course the homeless people who are outside are trying to survive because <laughs> it's 120 degrees and they're mm -hmm. trying to get water um so there's still the reality of nature everywhere but we've insulated ourselves from it and part of that process of insulating ourselves from it is you lose connection to the more subtle aspects of nature um and this would be subtle or not so subtle um the spirit of the land right like the idea that everything is everything has this sort of quality of spirit and it's easy for us to say from like an anthropomorphic lens 
the human being has spirit, the human being has soul, but then everything else is sort of stuff, it's sort of just like dead stuff that's here for our use. And there's this kind of idea that goes all the way back to Genesis and the Bible that, you know, the beasts of the earth and the fowl and the fish and all the things were created for the use of man. And that um, this was really just for us. And there's this sort of um, dominance hierarchy in, in our deep myths and stories that puts us sort of in the image of God, but nothing else in the image of God. And and even the, <laughs> this fucked up thing, too, is that it's actually more men in the image and then women as the sort of sidekick. But, um, you know, and I'm not trying to attack any particular religion or anything. I'm just pointing to the idea that's pretty obvious when you step back and look at it or when you have an experience that forces you to see like an ayahuasca journey where you realize there is absolutely no separation. We came out of the earth. We came out of the land. We belong to the land. And like what you're talking about, sacred reciprocity with the land where we give when we take, we give back when we take. Um, this is an idea that's so obvious because it, it's sustainable. It's a sustainable idea, right? Like if you don't give back when you take, if you don't have reciprocity woven into your myths and memes and metaphors and stories and song lines and these types of things, then you you ultimately end up in a pathological, disconnected paradigm of separation where you end up in a race to the bottom where we where where clear top mining the mountains and we're clear cutting the forests and we're overfishing the oceans and we're replacing those fish with plastic and waste and pollution. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a disaster. It's a, it's a catastrophe. It's a tragedy. It's, it's like when you wake up to it, you wake up with a whimper when you realize the current, you know, sort of trajectory of man and the fate of the rest of the species is a byproduct of our actions and our own fate that we're sealing, right? Like as we summon the, the AI overlords and the machine age and all of these things, you know, it's like, it's pretty fucked up. So like, yeah. um, I, and without going super dark side, I'm just trying to say like this idea of re-indigenize or remember where you come from, remember the land, remember the water, the sacred water that all life comes from. And we've, we've, we've gotten so forgetful that we take that sacred liquid life and we just put it in plastic receptacles and commodify it and sell it for money and create single use trash and that ends up back in the water inevitably which poisons the very water that sustains us so we're in this um bad trip <laughs> some kind of bad trip that we're trying to wake up from and you know when you <clears throat> when you have the connection still even now in this modern world when there's still the stories from tens or i don't know how many thousands of years ago these these ancient oral traditions and these song lines and these um these ways of relating these ways of life as you say that are that are not out of balance that are that have remembered sacred reciprocity and that have some wisdom it's this ancient story that we have to remember if we're going to really just even survive let alone thrive on this planet which we 1000 percent should be doing you know yeah i i think also like we look at you know like indigenous um cultures and and, and, and people that are still performing their ceremonial ways of life kind of look at it like as like almost primitive you know but these are forms of technology that have been used for thousands of years and continue to be used in a way that is in connection with the earth. Like I think it's some of the most advanced things on the planet. You know, yeah, we have a mindset of like we're the most advanced uh, in, in this Western world of developing more and more technology. And yeah, technology is it's good. It can be used for, for, for positive things. But when you look at like the way that these people are, are living, it, it, I think they we're, we're, what we're missing is we're missing the ability to really feel like the earth, like slow down, like seasons. We're not meant to be, we're not machines. We're not meant to be you know, working 12, 10 hours a day every day. We're not designed for that. You know, we're designed for going into, you know, going inward in, in winter and in going into some form of hibernation, you know, taking care of our family. 
and then you know come springtime we start to stretch out and stretch out and, and, and move more in summer where full in, in production mode as the energy in the sun is you know picking up and then autumn or fall you know we're, we're winding back down again but the society that we're, we're we're in right now it's just it's non-stop you know it just demands more and more and more of us every day so I, I really pray for that for people that have better, you know, consciousness about, you know, the ability. We 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 have the ability to to move the direction of where we're going, mm. and I'm, and I don't like to talk about like from a fear mongering point of view of like being sold an idea that it's my fault that um, you know like corporations are, are doing like destructive things to the planet. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. It's not people listening as fault. You know, we we can we can contribute or we cannot contribute, but I really feel that it's it's about giving, you know, like re-indigenizing yourself is not, uh, it's not also about like yourself, like me. It's more about sitting with elders and sitting with First Nations people that cultures are still existing. You know, if you look, you take like uh, the certain tribes in the Amazon, like the, the Witoto Moroi people, they still have societies that operate you know, and have operated for thousands of years. They still plant food together. They still live in community. And they're still like moving, they've learned to harness the environment in the best possible way, to use the environment, you know, to, to be in harmony with that and to, to live off the land. And they're still, they're still operating as they were thousands of years ago. Yet everywhere we go, we're causing more and more destruction. You know, we're, we're poisoning more and more, like you're saying, more and more water systems are being poisoned and poisoned. So for me also, it's about slowing down and listening. And listening to the land. So what does listening to the land mean? Listening to the land is taking time to understand like what happens where you live. Like where what flowers bloom at a certain time. Here where I am in Australia, there's a flower that blooms and that tells you that there's the mullet fish are running north. So it's time to go fishing. You know, that those kind of things are, are happening here. Like what birds are coming in? Where's the sun rising and setting? You know, but we're so in this world of producing on this hamster wheel that we're 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 not actually sitting and feeling the land like there's i know i know people here there's elders here who you know told, told tell me stories about like farmers who have land right and they they build some stuff on their land and all of a sudden their wives getting sick the kids are really sick everyone's getting sick you know and they don't know what to do and they bring in an elder and an elder's like, yeah, well, up there, that's that's an old burial ground, or that's a, um, a a ground where we did ceremony, or men's business, or women's business, as they say here in Australia. And you're you're disrupting the spirit, so you get sick, you get sick spiritually. So they go in and they help them kind of like reorganize things and and make peace with with the land and the, the old people. They say the spirits on the land, and then everyone gets better. You know, so that's it's the lack of spirituality, and spirituality is not. It's not a hippie thing. It's not, it doesn't have to be this new age kind of way of looking at life. It's, 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 it's a real thing. Like you said before, like the earth is powerful. You, you, you try to be peace and love in the jungle. See how far you get. You know, go to Northern Australia and like say peace and love to a crocodile. That's not, that's not nature. Nature is fierce. Nature, nature is, it's, she's, she's wild, you know, and it's about, understanding how to how to live in that that environment how to relate to there's areas where you shouldn't you shouldn't go you know spiritually it's there's not good energy there yeah 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 josh josh is uh you know an amazing podcaster and he's he just nailed this exact idea with his most recent uh his most recent episode mm. so i'll i'll link that in the show notes for anyone who's who's curious just because it's so important like it's it's because it, what we're what we're doing is we're destigmatizing something that most people would call superstitious. You know what I mean? Like they would say, "Oh, they're, they're just they're they're superstitious." Like you said, almost primitive way of thinking, right? Or not even almost. People would definitely call it a primitive way of thinking. Um, <clears throat> and I'm a hundred and thousand percent for the scientific method for critical thinking and and and. Uh, using different methodologies and systems of logic and, and reason to sort of make sense of what's going on around you and the universe and to, you know, like what we've done with, in, mo in modernity, we've, we've gained mastery over causal process, as Forrest Landry would say. We're basically like, we're able to 
we're able to understand enough to basically create magic, right? Mm -hmm. um, something that, you know, our ancestors would see as magic. Um, so it's, it's not that um, we aren't capable and that science hasn't got us to being capable, but science can only answer, um, it can't, it, science can't answer what we ought to do. So that's where spirituality comes in. That's where wisdom has to be cultivated because we can do all kinds of crazy shit, but should we? And what ought we do? What ought we be doing? Um, and this is where I think it, you, you have to take these ideas of, of spirit and, and animism and the, the ideas of like, why would it stop with the edge of the table? Why reality continues beyond my table and into the ether and into everything else. And, and my field continues beyond the membrane of my skin. And that's why I can sense danger, you know, or that's what, you know, it's obvious. Like, and, and, and if you, just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's not there. We can only see one tiny, tiny percentage of the electromagnetic spectrum of light. Most of what is there is not visible to our eyes. So this is, I mean, this is science backs this up. This isn't woo mm -hmm. at all. This is just, this is just obvious. And so it's like, why not become more sophisticated and curious about the non-visible, the subtle aspect of reality why not slow down and pay attention and this is why i'm a big fan of of meditation uh and just obviously float tanks like if you've listened to this podcast at all you're like this guy won't shut the fuck up about float tanks <laughs> because it's like that is that is it that is it it's it's the exact medicine it's slow down get away from your phone put up put down the tiktok and all of the other noise mm -hmm. the news cycle whatever put it all away go inward the, something like a float tank is just forcing that like naturally like there's no way not to be faced with the reality of your inner world when you turn off all the lights and all the sensations and you just lay down that is that is going to come up no matter what and mm -hmm. people are just scared of what's going to come up so they don't want to do it right? they don't want to do the work they don't want to be with their busy mind and their anxiety or whatever but that's the only way to heal it right the, the truth is the only thing that can set you free. So to come down into the reality of the moment and the reality of your spirit, your core, your center, like finding, finding the I am at the center of it all. And um, from there, get your fucking bearings, you know, like actually figure out which way is, where are my directions, you know, like mm -hmm. wh where is my true north? Like how can I, what can I orient to in this mm -hmm. reality, in this life? And um, that's a spiritual practice. <laughs> that's just what it is. Like, that's a spiritual practice. It's like coming down into the core of what ought I do and why, like, why do anything? You know, what is your ethics? What, what is your compass? And, um, we've, our compass, because we've, because we've lost this connection to spirit, our compass points in one, it's fixed in like one direction and it doesn't actually update with new information. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's stuck in the direction of, uh, well, for most people, money, you know, mm -hmm. or some sort of very narrow metric that they can sort of measure the success of their life by, um, whether it's stuff or a, a, a famous title, right? A building named after you or with your name on it, if your name's Trump, right? Like, like all the things have your name on them. <laughs> like, it's amazing. It's all, it's my name. It's, it's mine. It's like this strange sort of pathological sense of I'm so separate that I can own all this stuff. Like I can own the land. And, and this is, sounds like an alien idea to people who are, live in properties, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. in properties now. Everyone's sitting in a property somewhere <laughs> and it's someone's property and yeah. they're listening to this podcast or they're driving down the public property of the freeway or whatever. And it's just like, wait, 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 wait. How can you own the crispness of the air or the sparkle of the water. Mm. How can you own any of it? It's just the mystery. It's just magically happening. All of this is happening. And for some fucking miracle reason, we evolved out of single cell life into some sort of neocortex for the planet that's figuring out how to wake up and how to connect and how to do stuff. And I, I think, you know, there's this idea that, you know, nature's just like completely random, right? And it's just, 
it's just like throwing all of the different um, possibilities at the wall and seeing what's sticking, right? So it's like all the extinct species and all the fallen civilizations and all of the the death in the, it's just random. It's just an accident. And so is the life. It's just like sort of a panspermia sort of randomness or whatever of, of infinite uniqueness and mystery. It's, it's gorgeous, but at the same time, it's kind of without purpose, right? And I'm like, okay, sure. That makes sense. Like I, I can get on board with the idea, like the, the non-dual sort of Eastern mystics who are like, you know, like the word in Chinese for nature, I, I don't know it in how to say it in Mandarin, but it's basically like what happens of its own accord or for, for no particular reason, right? It's just, mm. it's just a happening, right? It's just, it's its nature. It's just doing the thing. And it's not for a why. It's not really a why. That's the why. The why is, or the what is the why. Like it's doing it for the sake of doing it. And I'm, I'm 100% like on board with that on some level. But then on another level, just think about the earth as an organism because it is. Because everything like the, the hermetic law of, of correspondence, as above, so below, right? The microcosm mirrors on the macrocosm. Everything is connected. So if a single cell can be life, can be an organism, which of course it can, that's how life started. All bacteria and amoebas, all these single celled sort of organism, organisms. Why wouldn't you assume that on the macro level, a planet, a single cell from that level is also an organism, right? Mm -hmm. And it's evolving consciousness. It's sort of consciousness emerging. And over billions of years and deep epochs of time, the earth has been heavily bombarded by space, absolutely uh, uh, like uh, eviscerated in the early beginning stages, I believe, of, of the earth's history. And then less and less often uh, periodically i would say you know in terms of like big extinct extinction events and i don't know to what degree that rhythm really is i think it's a mystery i think we're still trying to figure out what is the cyclical nature of the cosmos like we're in these rhythms of seasons obviously but what are the bigger seasons what are the the great year the procession of the equinox these like greater cycles of time that take the earth through terrain like or as you would say the spirit of the land is not good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like there's terrain where the earth passes through, like say the torrid meteor stream in, in late June and November where, or late June and Halloween, actually the day of the dead is actually right when we pass through the torrid meteor stream, which is a fascinating coincidence given mm -hmm. the fact that like all the cultures around the earth celebrate it around the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's like weird that the death day that we all remember the lost souls and the, 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 the lost ancestors and whatnot lands when we pass through a debris field of death and desolation like that that we couldn't imagine but that lives deep inside our dna which i believe <laughs> now that i've integrated it for a few years that horrifically traumatic hardcore night i shouldn't say traumatic it was it was traumatic in the moment but um like i said now that i've integrated it i see I see what I see it for what it was, and it was powerful. But this ceremony I experienced um, on the land in Santa Elena with you present and um, at Eagle Condor Alliance, and I was experiencing apocalypse. I was experiencing hellfire. I was experiencing the end of time, mm -hmm. and and I realize now it's like DNA is like the most efficient way of like encoding information, you know, <laughs> like that nature's figured out, and why would we just lose something like, you know, generations, like may, potentially many generations of human life that was horrifically hard to sur like survival times of like ice ages and post-apocalyptic ca catastrophes. Like, you know, you get these myths of Noah's flood and all the rest. There's like thousands of these stories of lost um, or, or, or long ago times of, of, of devastation. And so like, um, why wouldn't our DNA hold some signature, some memory of those ancestors that made it through? Because we're all descendants from the ones who made it through. Mm -hmm. So like our ancestors survived those times. And then, you know, you drink a heavy cup of, of ayahuasca and all of a sudden you're in it and you're back in it. Right. And it's like, whoa. And everyone, you know, is gone or you're, you can't find them, you know? And it's like, you're just screaming out for your, your love, your beloved. Where are they? And that's what I was doing for, for hours. Well, it seemed like for eternity for me, that was one of those nights. And, um, the reason I'm bringing all of this up is because, uh, 
this idea of of remembering our relationality, right, and re- remembering our place in the cosmos, is is key. And Earth's place in the cosmos and our place on the Earth is all connected. And I think you know this idea that it's all purposeless. The Earth remembers going through debris fields. The Earth remembers bombardment. The water holds the story of all of it. And water is this mystical, I don't even know what to call it. It's like liquid crystal or something. Like it's this crazy, it's this crazy thing that it, like can hold information and memory. And I, I just know that from the float tank. Like it, to me, it's become after a thousand hours floating, that's become clear. Go get in the ocean. And, you know, like, especially where the ocean's just pure magic, like Maui or something, you know, like, I'm sure, you know, places to go where the water is just magic. And it's like that, that leaves an impression on you when you get in the water there. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, just to finish this thread that's been all over the place, I think that the earth is potentially remembering what's coming. It's remembering the, the cycles. It's remembering the rhythm of, of its greater cycles, its cosmic years. And, and uh, what if we are just like our race to technology, our race to rockets, our race to these tools has been some sort of unconscious evolutionary leap forward for the earth because it can develop the appendages that can move aside the devastation that resets evolution, that resets us back down to the Stone Age, you know? And if we're going to ever become the next iteration of life, potentially pans- panspermia, or this idea that the Earth is potentially shooting us off into the cosmos to fertilize and to reproduce and to spread nature throughout reality, throughout whatever. You know, I mean, like it's not already there, but I'm saying, you know what I mean? Like, just we're the messengers um, of Earth, are the messenger DNA. And what if we're really just like all this trash and devastation and pollution and all of this is almost like a necessary cost that to get to a technologically sophisticated enough civilization that it can wake up to its cosmic environment in, in, in a, no, well, not to say we weren't awake to it before. Cause of course you have these incredible, um, cultures of astronomers, right. And, and, and mastery of sacred architecture that mirrors the sky on earth. And so I'm not saying ignorance of astronomy. What I'm saying is ability to shoot rockets into space. Right. And that's like a, it's a new thing that humans are doing as far as I can tell. And there would be probably trash up in space if, unless they figured out a cleaner way to do it in the past. But we've got, mm-hmm. um, we've got no clues so far. We're the first ones as far as we know. And, and that's probably for a reason. Like, I don't think it's happening for no reason. I think that there's a teleology to it. There's like a, a value set or a purpose, like more beauty or something. And the earth's trying to expand in some way. And, I mean, this call to rockets, what's that for, you know? Yeah, it's there's a lot happening right now on the planet. Yeah, sorry for that like that thread that just I just didn't, I didn't give you like anywhere to go other than everywhere. <laughs> okay. no, that's good though. Everywhere is good. I think um, definitely there's a lot going on on the planet, and I look at everything you're talking about about ancestors and you know what what have we been through? Like what have our ancestors been through? Good or bad? They've done something to continue to continue on life, to sustain life so that we can be here right now. So that me and you are sitting here right now recording this podcast. And when people are listening to this podcast, they're sitting in them in that moment, listening to that, you know, maybe take a moment of reflection about, you know, what did my ancestors go through in terms of, Famine, disease, migration, war, you know, cosmic destruction on the planet, whatever, whatever it was, we were still here, you know, and there's a lot of different nations that are still here in their, in their, um, yeah, let's say tribal, tribal levels, you know, but apparently, you know, we're the most sophisticated, um, species on the planet. We talk about, you know, rockets and AI and all this stuff. Yet we're still the only species that defecates in its water source. 
so I get a little confused about you know what we're actually doing, and I I remember listening to a, a podcast again, uh, the Emerald Podcast, and talking about how we're kind of letting you know teenage boys dictate the trajectory of the human race. <laughs> in terms was that of is a, was that his episode on AI, the Sorcerer's Apprentice? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. A masterpiece episode. Sorry, go ahead. That, a very impactful podcast, I think, for a lot of people, uh, myself included. And it's, it just kind of seems like we're, we're, we're letting these men, you know, because it's, it's, it's predominantly men in, in this world of like technology, kind of lead us on this kind of crazy you know, trajectory towards God knows what. Like, is it, so, is, is it like watching kids? little boys build a like i watch my kids build a tower you know and it's like they build it higher and higher and higher and then it's like let's knock it down you know it's just always like pushing we need to push more and more and more and instead of what i see is a missing link there is that within indigenous societies that still operate and still have tradition they have certain ceremonies where there's initiations for young men so at the age of 12 or 13, you go through some form of initiation to recognize I am a man now. I have responsibility. One of those ceremonies that we do involves not you know, abstaining from water for four days and four nights and food. Known as, you know, it's a vision quest ceremony. Uh, so abstaining from something that's life-giving, putting yourself in a, in a, in a place of uh, fear, um, you know, being, you know, pushing yourself to limit at that age and, and doing all, what we say is like, um, sp like f almost like spiritual suffering. There's a sense of humility. You know, you come back to yourself of like, I really don't have existence here without water. You know, if, if I don't have water for three or four days, like I don't exist. It doesn't matter how much money I have, you know, what I, what, sales funnels I have or what I know about AI or like what I'm building or what tech company I own. If I don't have this resource and it's more than a resource, it's a spirit, it's a memory. It's a, we, we say it's a, a spiritual technology. If I don't have this, then I don't exist. And I think through these practices, you know, immersing yourself more in nature and these initiation practices, you understand that, okay, there's a circle of life here and I have a position, I have a place, but I'm not more important than the next person. I'm not more important than an ant. I'm not more important than a bird or a tree or my neighbor or the homeless person outside. That we're all in this together, you know, and there's humility there. And it's like, okay, well, maybe I can, maybe I need to walk a little, a little more humble, you know, in the eyes of the creator. You know, the, the best thing to do is to be humble. To, to be authentic, but if we're consistently pushing this this uh, this limit higher and higher and higher of like, well, what what are we trying? What are we achieving? We're just feeling trying to fill an empty void. You know, we're not content of where we are. We're not bringing back the memory of like, geez, you know, my my ancestors did all this this struggle, and what am I what am I giving for the future generations? Am I going to be the one that fucks it up for them? You know, am I going to be that that weak link like? You know, my ancestors like fighting off, um, you know, like wild animals in the jungle and I'm flicking on TikTok you know, at 11 p.m. It's like, come on, man, you know, like do something, like own your life, own more than and people were so concerned about owning things, but they don't want to own their life, you know, own the moment, the moment of waking up before the sun rises, the moment of seeing the sunrise, the moment of praying for life when it comes up and being grateful that you have another day on this planet. You know, th th these are forms of gratitude, of, of humility, of living in nature. I'm not, I'm not here telling people go, go like uh, live in a, you know, don't shave your arms and legs or as a female or whatever, like, you know, just like go, go wild, go completely like savage and go, go live. feral. Go <laughs> feral. Like feral, you know, feral is not, that's not what it's about. You know, like, indigenous cultures are clean they're in order everything's in order you know but i'm not telling you to go live in in, in the forest or the bush and just completely disconnect i'm just saying like start with having a bit of gratitude 
you know, a bit of humility in life. You know, like go down to a water source, sit down by a river. You know, talked about you were just saying like water has memory. It's like every water around where you live, every water body of water, it has a memory. Yeah, you know, there's a water source here called the uh, the Artesian Basin in um, far north Queensland, in central Queensland, and there's a guy there. His name's Gorigula, he's an indigenous guy. He's been fighting off Adani's uh, coal mine for about oh, 1,117 days, I think. He lit a fire. So, so, so he's got a coal a coal mine trying to. No, yeah, uh, Adani, who's I think he's I believe he's the third richest man in the world. There's a coal mine there. And it's on his uh, ancestral lands. I went up and interviewed him on my podcast, and that was like a, a crazy journey. You know, we had to kind of sneak on this mine site, you know, get past all these like security and HR, and it was it was weird. It was really strange. And then we got to the back of the mine site. So there's half of the le- the mining lease. He's occupying it because it's his tribal lands, right? So half of the mine site is being used to mine coal, and the other side, he's made a camp and he's. Um, he's exercising his right under the Human Rights Act to perform his cultural you know, ways of life. And no one can do anything about it because he's been recognized. So he's out there doing that. So, so in his, and his uh, obviously mission is to stop the mining from continuing, right? His mission is to save the water, is to protect the water because right. the Artesian Basin is one of the largest bodies of water, like, um, under the uh, it's under the earth and it's like one of the, the largest uh, underground sources of water in australia it's it's huge and when i went up there there's a spring where the water comes up yeah and the byproducts from you know the mining and, and all the, the leftover like material is is you know contaminating these water sources and he was telling me like this water you know hasn't seen the light of day since it's jurassic water you know, the last people to see this water were the dinosaurs, the last beings were the, the dinosaurs. <laughs> like no one's wow. seen the water. So, and it just bubbles up into this spring. Wow. So, you know, there's, there's, there's people out there doing these, these kind of um, really amazing things around, you know, water and protection of land. How crazy, how crazy is it that we would call the the fucking corporation and the CEO of that. I don't know who who he is or whatever the billionaire yeah. is behind the corp or whatever. But we call that like winning. We call that guy a win- winner for being a billionaire and for flying around in a private jet, burning not coal but basically the same idea. You know, shit that we yeah. pulled out of the ground uh, without giving anything back, and we're just lighting it up, lighting the liquid starlight on fire as fast as possible. Um, and just lighting everything up as much as possible. And it's like forgetting that, like that rhythm, that cycle, that 24 hours, half of that, or that daily cycle, half of it's darkness. You know what I mean? Like half of it is dark for, you know, that's just the way it evolved. And for whatever reason, this is the way the universe is. We have bodies of celestial bodies and there's cycles and the sun is over here and we've go around it and we spin on our axis and all these motions and it's complex, but at the same time, it's beautiful and it's, it's consistency in some sense. It's like, it's, you know, that the earth will keep spinning, you know, and you know that the sun will rise because it always has, thank God, right? Like the sun is the God and thank you for rising sun God, right? Mm -hmm. So rising from the dead, Jesus, sun God, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like this is, this is what it is. It's thanking, thanking the sun for life. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause that's what it is. Right. And we burn the liquid life for energy and we drink the liquid life for real energy, like vitality, um, biological life. Right. Mm-hmm. And the problem is, is as you start pulling out these treasures of the earth, these, you know, millions of years or billions of years old energy sources that are just like batteries that the earth's been storing through photosynthesis. It's like, you're taking our reserves. It's like, just like draining an aquifer. It's the same kind of idea. Like, what if we need that, right? What are we using it for? Like, we're frivolously using the fuck out of it. Like, that's for sure. We're not, we're wasting as much as possible. Like all the street lights that are on 24 seven, like, you know what I mean? Like the, the endless amount of light. Like I live in Las Vegas, so I'm sensitive to it. Like you can tell I'm wearing the blue blockers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Vegas forced me into, into blue blockers because if I walk outside, I don't see stars. I see the fucking stratosphere and I see a blue haze that changes colors because of the sphere. Mm-hmm. I don't know if, if you've seen the sphere, but it's basically this kind of 
impressive geometrical architecture that's also kind of an abomination. <laughs> it's like, let's build this crazy, let's build this crazy thing that no one's ever built, like this giant sphere. And not mm -hmm. only will it be like architecturally impressive and, and massive and curved and all this stuff, but it will be it will be technologically insane. It'll have this insane screen that puts you in an immersive experience on the inside. And then the outside will be a giant screen as well. And it will be flashing all this crazy shit out to the world, right? And it's yeah. like, okay, that sounds awesome until you think about like the secondary and tertiary effects. And then you're like, wait, this is not that great. Like, what about all the humans who live in the city? <laughs> what about all the life in the city that, that wants darkness because it's dark time? And that's mm. the rhythm of life is like light and dark, especially for the desert when it's so hot during the day that so much is happening at night. And, and it's like that, that didn't evolve under blue light. It evolved with the moonlight. You know what I mean? And, and so blue light is actually uh, in certain contexts really bad for your biology and mm -hmm. can fuck with your circadian rhythm as a human, you know, just getting it into your eyes, but probably not just as a human, all the other animals are dealing with it. So it's, yeah, this idea that a coal company or fossil fuels company, whatever, sees a short-term value of turning that coal into dollars as more valuable than the real treasure of the earth, which is water. Nothing is more precious than water, as far as I can tell, uh, other than maybe the sunlight, but they go kind of together, like sunlight on, on, on hard ground, on rock alone doesn't yield life. And so you need, you need that liquid mother and they go together, the sacred fire and the sacred water. And they, you know, that is the, that is Jesus and Mary, you know, that the, the Mary, the Magdalene, the wife, the, 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 the goddess, right? Like the goddess of the God. This is the idea of a lot of the early Christian cults, um, specifically the ones that were merging traditions from say, uh, pagan Greek speaking peoples who were worshiping Artemis, the goddess, right? And they fused this culture of the goddess with the Judeo culture from through through Jesus of of mm -hmm. the of the father, right? Of God the Father and, and this patriarchal lineage. And you had a fusion that was actually um mystical, like the mystical union of 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 God and goddess, of masculine mm -hmm. and feminine in the sacred sacrament, the sacred ceremony of the bridal chamber, where you and your wife commune with the God together, you know, as God and goddess. So it's like, there's this sort of sacredness to um, aspects of Christianity that we've also lost, right? So you asked where I come from, right? Like, where do you, where do you come from? You know, what is your lineage? What is your tradition? And I, I'm Christian. <laughs> so like, that is my lineage. And so it's like, the lineage of Christ, the, the lineage of, um, well, my version that I grew up with was a lineage of, uh, of, of the sacrificial king, um, the lineage of Jesus, the sacrificial king, who, who is uh, God incarnate, but he's the only one, you know, like mm -hmm. God incarnate, but he's the only one. He, he's the one with the miracles and who's rising, raising, been re being raised from the dead. Um, and he is the embodiment of, of God in the flesh, but, but not, not you that, you know, he's the savior, he's the King, but not you. And, um, I don't think that's actually what the original juice was potentially, but even if it was, and even if that's, um, which it was, it wasn't like, there was all kinds of different ways of, 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 of living Christian Christianity and Christians expressing Christianity in many ways in the early era of Christianity for the first 300 years after Jesus was, was basically panspermia of different cults, different sects of ways of practicing and merging diaspora, merging with all of the uh, different languages and people in different areas in Egypt and in, you know, Israel and in, and in uh, all the Mediterranean, right? Like basically Rome. So it's like, you're, you're seeing this crazy thing emerge, this meme take hold. That's probably one of the most powerful memes in human history not the most. I mean, it's got the most humans uh, kind of locked in, you know what I mean? In, in terms of like running the software, like bought into the story. And you have to ask why, like, what is it about that story that's so compelling, that's so captivating, you know? And what is the history of the story? And I think that 
without making this <laughs> a whole podcast about Christianity, it's just kind of coming up for me right now. But I think that um, to re-indigenize as a Christian has something to do with the Jesus story, it has something to do with remembering the nature of the Christ, which I think is the Trinity in a nutshell. I think the Trinity is the unlock. And I'm going to have a guy on the podcast uh, soon, hopefully, named Jordan Hall, who um, is one of the most potent thinkers that I've come across. And I was really surprised to see maybe a year or two ago, he kind of came out of the closet, so to speak, and announced publicly that he was a uh, Christian and that he is now baptized and participating in a church out in, uh, you know, you know, wherever he lives, I want to like, I don't want to <laughs> oust his cool town so that, so that everyone moves there, <laughs> you know, but like, but basically, basically, um, this idea that you can be an incredibly rational, reasonable human and also still get the juice of Christianity and also still understand that there's something there to unlock. There's something there that's valuable. And personally, I think that, well, at least what I've feel like I've had unlock for me more recently is this idea of the Trinity of the the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So if if Father is the ultimate reality, if Father is the Brahman or or the 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 infinite, right? Like the idea of 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 of, of all of it. Like there's nothing outside of it, you know. And there's this there's this sort of holy flame that's animating all like it's creation you know what i mean it's it's creation happening it's what's shining the sun it's the arrows well there's this there's this feminine aspect of reality that's receiving that's the void that the the potential the birthing process of all of it right that's coming out of the water it's coming out of the 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 void the ether what you know this is god and goddess like the the masculine and feminine dance of creation um all the way up and down the evolutionary chain from subatomic to cosmic. This is this allurement, this intimacy of masculine and feminine, feminine is happening everywhere. And um, I think that's the Holy Spirit and, and God, if you want, or Father, if you want to call it in the Trinity. So, so what is the Son? And this is what, where I think it's lost to most Christians, because most Christians would say, well, that's Jesus the Christ. And I would say that. Christ was not his name. <laughs> and Christ is the son of God. And we are all in the body of Christ, meaning the son is God on the inside. The son is the subject. The son is the self. And the self is experiencing the ultimate, is experiencing the rest of the Godhead, the rest of the Trinity. And we are participatory in that. We are divine beings participating in this, you know, incredible miracle of life. And, um, to me, that's what Christianity could actually be telling, that, that story, an empowering story of the sovereignty of the self, um, giving yourself all of the properties you've relegated to Jesus Christ, besides maybe having to suffer on the cross. <laughs> because I don't think, I don't think that you, you need to be a, a savior, martyr type figure. I think that we all have our genius and we all have this kind of unique creative creativity that's emerging through us and right now is the best time to ever be alive to participate in this like you know symphony that's emerging with you know our our species as it's trying to gain coherence with our superstructure and our stories and our sense make of what's actually happening and how do we play nice games and win-win games and actually protect the water as as a planetary species that's the stewards of the of the earth the stewards of the rock you know mm. and it's like how how can we get more and more into that space. And I think that Christianity has to play a role. Religion has to play a role, like of all kinds. But because what is sacred, if we do not make the water sacred, there will not be, there will be just thirsting generations and there will not be a future. So we mm -hmm. have to know that story. We have to remember. Yeah. What are the, is there, um, in Christianity, and I speak here from you know, like a level of say ignorance. I'm a unbaptized human in in this in this life. But is there ceremonial practices that are done in Christianity around like the use of water? 
So the the greatest one that comes to mind is baptism, but also um, mm -hmm. for most people, the Eucharist or the sacrament also includes water, but traditionally it's consumed as wine. So mm -hmm. um, that tells you that tells you something there as well. I think in terms of um, one of two things with the wine, either wine is more sacred than water, right? Which I don't think that's necessarily what it was. I don't think that's necessarily how it started, but mm -hmm. a lot of people could, could see that, you know, like a, a vintage of like extremely, you know, like, like wine, grapes that you grew. I mean, it is water, like wine is water as well, but I'm just saying like a lot of people would, would value alcohol as higher on the chain, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's what wine was. I don't think it was even alcohol in the beginning. I think it was a sacrament. I think it was an actual, um, psychedelic probably, or some sort of entheogen, some sort of mind altering or mind expanding sort of experience. And the Greek word for wine is that, that they use in describing in these medical texts and in these older Greek texts describing sort of the practices and the pharmacology of all of this, right? Like there's so much complex pharmacology in the, in the ancient world that the word though for wine wasn't, it wasn't alcohol. That's actually an Arabic word that we get later. Mm -hmm. It's pharmacon, which just means the drug basically. Like it's, it's a drug, not necessarily alcohol. So I think that the Eucharist and the, and the partaking, the original Eucharist and the, the way of communing with the God, right, was to actually take something more like ayahuasca, not necessarily mm. dimethyltryptamine, I don't know. But, you know, the, if, you, if you check out Ryan Murarescu's book, and I think he just put out a TED Talk as well, he, um, The Immortality Key is the name of the book. And he, he's done this deep dive research project for like something like 10 or 14 years or something, like more than 10 years he's spent researching this book and he he went to the sites in uh the mediterranean and he found these not not necessarily christian sites in this case this is an older tradition this was eleusis this is the greek you know the greek mystery school of the eleusinian mysteries so mm -hmm. eleusis is just outside of athens and they found it's not at eleusis because all those drinking vessels had been contaminated and preserved with preservatives But at a site in uh, Italy, they found the same drinking vessels that they used at Eleusis, and they found the same ceremonial iconography. And they, so they found someone practicing from that cult in a different location, and they found the drinking vessels, and they did archaeobotanical testing on it, and they, if that's the term. I don't know. They used some sort of chemistry sort of tech to figure out what the alkaloids were in the vessel. And they found alkaloids from ergot, which is a psychedelic fungus that grows on barley, I think. And, you know, can be used to synthesize like LSD. So you're, you're talking about some sort of psychedelic brew, right? Or drink mm -hmm. that was, that was the sacred Soma, the sacred sort of sacrament of their culture. And this culture fused with ultimately Christians, you know, it became Christian. It got reskinned. Dionysus became Jesus. And this is the, the sort of, uh, research done by Marescu and so many others. Like if you read John Mark Allegro's book, the Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, he's, he's talking also about this sort of ancient use of the mushroom and the psychedelic cults that were reskinned with different stories and different gods and different characters and, and different languages. They emerged, the language fused together, you know, it's just like, it's just like with genetics, right? Like cross pollination of ideas and stories. And so I think that the, the in, initial sort of Eucharist was more of an actual psychedelic sacrament, but the ceremony that to me feels more like the water ceremony would be um, baptism for sure. Mm. And I, you know, what do you, what do you know about baptism? Or you said, did you say you were baptized? No, no, I haven't been baptized. No. Oh, got it. Got it. Yeah. So if you're Mormon or you were raised Mormon, you get baptized when you're eight. And, um, because age is the age of, you can no longer get away with this shit, you know, like age is the, age is the age of accountability for them, for us. So it's like, uh, we, we take someone at that age and take them to the water, but not a river, usually not a, not a like body of water in nature. Usually, I mean, a lot of baptisms have happened that way, but once you have like facilities that usually happens in a church or a temple right mm -hmm. so um there's a baptismal font there's just a uh, an area a pool or whatever that you fill up and um 
Then you go in and there is a male priesthood bearer, priesthood holder. So somebody who holds the authority or the, the current of his lineage. He has been given to him by the laying on of hands by other men who were senior to him in authority and transferred their authority in some capacity to him. Not necessarily all of their authority. So for example, you can have an elder uh, ordain uh, uh, a lesser priesthood or a, a deacon or a teacher or a priest, right? Like these are lower offices than elder. And so uh, he has the authority to give, to kind of usher them up the ranks, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this in, in, in entire hierarchy, this structural kind of hierarchy that's all within the society of the men. And the women um, are more or less left out of it in terms of the, the authority to represent the God on the earth type of thing, which is what the priesthood is. So... Um, that all being said, so you, sorry, I was trying to give you some context. So it's like, yeah. so then you go in and there's this, there's this priesthood bearer and mm -hmm. he, um, he takes the eight year old and puts his hand on their shoulder and, um, holds another hand. So he'd put his right hand, left hand on their shoulder and his right hand in the air to the square like this. And, um, because this is the symbol of sort of calling in the authority of God, so to speak, right? Like mm -hmm. channeling your sort of. Uh, in some sense, it represents like the wand, right? Like uh, the mm -hmm. staff or the wand, which is sort of this phallic symbol of like, hey, we can channel heaven down to earth. It's this masculine symbol of authority, right? Like the the, the chief might carry it around, right, as a symbol. And um, this is this, anyways. This is sort of like saying a prayer to to initiate. So this is an initiation, initiating this young person into the service of the kingdom of heaven so mm. being baptized into the army of jesus so to speak mm -hmm. so there's almost like a a warrior sort of mindset to it like i remember as a kid being proud being proud to step up to the plate so to speak and like stand up for what i believe and there's this sort of i can only speak from my perspective but like a very masculine sort of sense of responsibility right mm -hmm. and uh and now you're responsible for your choices, right? Like before we were sort of letting you grow up and sort of, you know, whatever. But now it's like, now you're old enough to know better. And this is, you now have to choose, will you fight for Jesus or not? Right. And this is a question asked by your most respected people and pretty much everyone, you know, like it's like everyone, you know, is doing the same thing and asking you this question. And so it's kind of a misnomer. Like, of course, there's only one answer. And the answer is just like, yes, I want to belong to my community <laughs> because it's like every human child does, right? Like every human child's going to do what they have to, to adapt to their environment and survive and fit in and also find meaning and purpose. And this is the story, right? Like it's actually quite seductive and tempting to just, you know, swallow the story without questioning the, the I mean by the story in this case is just like the Book of Mormon and, and Mormonism and all this, but like. Because, because, you know, it's like a, a, a tight, knit, what it is, it's a tight knit community with a superstructure, with a set of scriptures and principles and values and stories that create order. They're ordering, they're ordering the chaos of the cosmos, right? And they're saying, this is what, and this is why, right? Like it's sort of giving you a story mm -hmm. and it's tempting to, to be like, oh, nice. This is like, I got not only community, but I got kind of like uh, it figured out for me you know what i mean in some sense like i've got i've got the um mystery mapped to a certain degree and i know what to do i just go through the motions i i i live a, I, I i follow the sort of tenets i get baptized i get ordained if i'm a boy into the priesthood and become a man that's the 12 year old vision quest you're talking about that doesn't actually try people in any way <laughs> like it's not really a rite of passage that that is is difficult it's just something that you do you know, um, how, did, how did your, when that happened to you, when you were baptized, what, how did that change your mindset, you know, of, of life? Well, you said you know, more responsibility. Like, do you remember like what changes happened? I th honestly, I know, I know that there's a component that has to do with my dad that, um, it was, it was, it, for me, it was a lot about just like, uh, belonging, making my parents proud and 
to, as far as like my, my mindset or how that shifted, I would say it probably was useful in, in, um, getting me to think more responsibly and try to like grow up a bit. But there was also this component of shame and guilt that gets sort of woven in also, which I think is tricky. Um, cause I don't think that was helpful. I think that the, because of this idea, right. That you're kind of without sin for the first eight years, but then after you get baptized, now there's consequences, right? Now it's like there's, you can sin and you can kind of create these derogatory marks on your record and it's going to all be kind of kept track of in heaven and there's going to be a accounting for all of that. And so now there's just, you know, not, not like um, intentionally trying to cause any sort of, you know, like, mis like, what would you call it? Like repressed emotions or shame or like, you know, any of that. I don't think it's done necessarily insidiously or intentionally. I think it's just a byproduct of people who are in this story of this paradigm that the sort of natural man is an enemy to God. The, um, the, the human being has to be subjugated, right? It has to be sort of, uh, corralled and it has to be sort of, um, what would you say? Conquered in some sense, right? Like yeah. you're, you're, you, you have these impulses that are bad. And you're supposed to sort of like get skillful at doing the the right thing, which is sort of pushing it down, you know, like, like yeah. fighting it back. And specifically with sexuality, you know, sexuality is probably one of the biggest ones that has a lot of shame, especially in, in Christianity, at least. I mean, that's just might be worse than other religions, but this is what, what I'm familiar with is just like in the Catholic church, there's, there's actually ritualized in, in the past, there's been and hopefully not anymore. I don't know. I think there's some really dark secrets in, in the Vatican. So I don't really know what the reality is now, but there's been ritualized sort of um, rape of children, you know, and like young boys and like very, very dark uh, happenings that have played out in the name of, in the name of religion and the name of, 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 of righteousness and fighting off evil. And when you are so allergic to the shadow and you, you push it so far away <clears throat> And everything dark is Satan and avoid it at all times, right? And uh, don't go into the float tank. It's dark in there. You're going to find the devil, right? It's like, wait, so this is why we leave the lights on. <laughs> this is obvious. Okay, we leave yeah. the lights on all the time. The streets are all lit up because we're terrified of the dark. We're terrified of our own shadow. And it's like if you, if you push the shadow away forever, then that thing that you're repressing will come out in you in the actual negative shadow expression. And so you'll become the abuser you'll become the rapist you know you'll become the person who's got the thing in the closet and he's doing it in the in the dark in this shameful way or whatever it is it's very strange and, and so i think that there's like a um i don't know this thing that came along with my baptism that started to specifically in my early teens i think created you know a lot of um shame and this was tied at the same time to this crazy thing that happened when I became a teenager, which was cell phones happened uh, and I had one and mm. I had internet access on a cell phone right when, you know, that was a thing, like pretty much pretty early on in the cell phone game. And I was just a this young teenager and I got access to basically an unlimited un, uh, library of pornography on the internet that never that never would have existed for any of my ancestors, <laughs> including my dad. Until, I mean, it's available to him now, I guess, but like as he was a, you know, a maturing boy. So instead of getting the, at 12, the, um, and, and I'm not blaming anyone because nobody could have seen this shit coming. Right. And I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not trying to say that like the adults in my community are somehow at fault for this or my parents, like my, my parents did everything they could to protect me. And, you know, they were very conscientious of that, but like I, still fell down this rabbit hole and like every fucking other teenage boy seems like you know what i mean and probably just humans girls as well it's just like the amount of search traffic and the amount of volume and the amount of pornography and the amount that's happening right now in the world is is just mind-bending and then you see like what the the downstream effects of that are on human development and sexuality and uh intimacy disorders and different things where it's just like we're we're in a really dark place with because sexuality is so kept in the dark. There was no healthy conversation in my culture around sexuality. So mm. I didn't have a different path, really. 
my path. Well, what I'm, what I mean is like the path was say no to all of your basically sexual impulse, say no to it. Masturbation's bad. Don't talk to girls in any sort of way like that. Don't date girls. Right. And so it's just like, push all of that aside or down or whatever you have to do. Right. And, um, at the same time that the cell phone is ex coming into existence with unlimited pornography. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. it's like, okay, could we, could we find a different way than just like, you know, that's not going to be, it doesn't work. Right. Uh, it hasn't worked for any of these younger kids. So, um, I think that, I think that there has to be a healthy relationship with, with sexuality and, um, this idea of, also what you mentioned, like the vision quest, this idea of initiation and giving people a, an aesthetic practice or a discipline or an, just even these rites of passage where they can get placed into that field of value and get placed into that relationality with their community and their tribe and their environment in a way that's rooted in um, sacred reciprocity and rooted in, you said it, you know, humility where you sort of feel that you're part of a bigger whole and that relation, a huge component of that relationality is, is sexual energy. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, that's, what's driving so much of creation. You know, I mean, creation is just basically sexual energy in some sense and it's, you know, played out for billions of years. And so it's like, how do you relate to that energy? You know what I mean? And how, why would you tell people to cut themselves off from it? and to push it away and to not cultivate it and to not give people breathing practices and embodiment practices and ways of actually transmuting the energy where you're not just this pent up fucking <laughs> bottle rocket, just like this crazy kid, you know? Uh, it's, it's like, I don't know. I, I, I think that those rites of passage are missing uh, for men and women, but just speaking for the guys out there, I, I feel like our society is so under masculinized and also the ma the masculine's actually been demonized so badly and it's it's like we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater and we've we don't have any real rites of passage for healthy ways of of relating in masculinity no not at all and yeah women have the a natural rite of passage which is to get their menstruation or moon time as it's called so yeah, that, that happens. A, that's nature's that's nature's way of initiating them because it's yeah. it's it's essential. It's it's like required. Yeah, and it's, it's a ceremony. There's a ceremony in that, and I think um, I was in ceremony a couple of weeks ago actually with a uh, a Navajo elder who was out here in Australia, and he was talking about the different ceremonies that happen when you know when we start to grow different hair on our body. And that in, in the Diné culture or Navajo culture that they, they have certain ceremonies and practices that they do with the young, the young people at that time. Mm. And it's, it's, it's really important that, you know, the, what, what I see from, you know, being immersed in these cultures is that young, young, young people are, are very focused in in certain things, you know, certain things of like cultural ways of life that they're not distracted by technology. You know, it's like, I see a lot of parents around here and they're like, oh, it's hard, you know, like with our children. And it's like, well, just don't, don't give them a phone. <laughs> you know, like they're 14, like they don't need a phone. It may be like a flip phone to like, you know, call now and then, but that's where I think there's a responsibility of the parents. It's not just suppressing it. It's like we have to be the example for the children. So it's it's a slippery slope, especially I, I see it more and more for kids at this age, in this you know in this time. You know the amount of technology, what you're saying, you know, is accessible. What are the, what's accessible now? Yeah, you know, even more. You know, talk about like pornography or like you know the dark web or the, there are so many things that are you know predators or you know grooming yeah i just to quickly interject i did a podcast with a guy named uh, tyson adams a few episodes ago who helps men heal pornography addiction and to kind of reclaim a healthy 
way of, of relating to your life force energy, re, re, reclaiming and, and revitalizing your, your life force energy. And so he's doing amazing work, but you know, we had a conversation that got kind of dark for a minute about what's actually happening and what's actually out there. And there are, there, there's types of, of pornography that actually brainwash people into self castration. Mm-hmm. So like to the point where you're so mixed up about your identity, about your gender, that you're self mutilate, you, you'll go through, uh, you know, starting out as a, as a healthy male, for example, and then mm-hmm ultimately becoming a eunuch right and well, well, this is this is um heavy 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 shit when you think about it you know when you think about like this weird you know it's it's like nature is metal like you know what you're saying there's like yeah. there's some metal aspects to nature yeah it's it's the technology world is i mean we can it's the same as christianity like we you know it's it has a place and i think that you know christianity in the in its fundamental values is a good thing but it's been used to persecute people in different forms by different you know like agendas you know you look at like the colonialism of north america for example and what the catholic what role the catholic church played there here in australia new zealand different parts of the world with taking children away from their families and indoctrinating them in boarding schools but I know that that the the basis of Christianity is love, you know, and that uh, you know Jesus was in in, in my understanding, it, it, you know, he was there for the people. It was a service to the people, and I think the same is with technology. It's like it, it's it's day and night. You know, we talked about that before. You know, the night comes in, you know, and there's also light. There's day. There's two opposing forces in this world. Yeah, and it's very easy to understand that because there's daytime and there's nighttime. There's those are the two energies. So we can use any of these things for good. You know, we can use water for for good purposes. We can use it for negative purposes. We can choose to elevate ourselves in consciousness or you know de elevate ourselves into like more you know like abyss. And right now, there's a responsibility that we have. I think in our generation, we're kind of picking up the pieces from our parents' generation of over-consumerism, of kind of steering the ship, you know, in, in a different direction. And we need to be coming back to, you know, like ways of like ancestral ways of living. So what are the fundamental things? It's like take care of your family, take care of your children. How do we do that? Well, for starters, you know, don't let them around those kind of forms of technology and, you know, immerse them more in, in other forms of, of nature. You know, it, it's very easy as a parent, and I speak as a parent, to be like, just throw, you know, put, put a movie on. You know, that, that's, yeah, a, that's, that, a, that's an excuse, you know, it's an easy way out. Yeah, no, it's, and it's tempting and it's super, it's, it's insidious because it really is like, can a babysit your child? You're, you're, they're going to be consumed by it, right? They're going to yeah. be pulled in. They're going to be consumed. And that's what's happening is like these younger generations are being consumed by something and it's extracting something from them, like their attention. And uh, it's having neurobiological effects and structural effects. And they're evolving necks that are forward, full, tilted forward with hunches. And um, mm-hmm. there's actually a term for that. I, I can't think of it. There's a, there's, you know, a thing happening with the blue light exposure with all those screens where, you know, they're getting um, all kinds of strange, you know, problems that, that we couldn't yeah, predict. Anxiety, like yeah. even obesity is being linked to blue light exposure, mm-hmm. which is very strange. And yeah. so like there's, but uh, we're so sensitive to light and this is a type of light you, you, you only get, you know, in a full spectrum of all the other light in, in our ancestral past, that was the case. It was always part of a, a spectrum with all this other types of light. And now you're just isolating out these particular part uh wave wavelengths of light where you're getting you know like exposure to things that are in some sense alien to your biology right and yeah. you're evolving in that state and so now you've got these you know now now our society is is just suffering from it um not just from the different technologies but all of the pollutions that we've created from those and the mm-hmm. phthalates and the and the plastics and the forever chemicals and the PFOAs and all these things that are completely destroying fertility and creating an, a fertility crisis in the modern age where, you know, if you listen to people like Shauna Swan and her book Countdown, she thinks that we're an endangered species because it's so, it's so um, bad and it, mm-hmm. the trajectory is so 
alarming. You know, if you look at the plummeting testosterone levels and sperm counts in males and, you know, one in six women, I think now one in six couples rather struggles to get pregnant. It might be, um, it might be more than that now. I don't know. It's like, it's like there's this acceleration to it too, because of what we're continuing to do. So it's not like it's going to get better <laughs> right away, right? Like we're probably going down for a while longer before we correct, if we, if we do correct course at all. So that's a, that's a bummer. Um, and I, I feel like reclaiming our relationship to sexuality turns us immediately to reclaiming fertility, which mm -hmm. is reclaiming health, mm -hmm. which is relating to the environment. Because mm -hmm. if you shit in the, if you poison the well, right, then you poison yourself and your descendants. And so it's like, what are we borrowing from the future here? Like, what are we taking from our descendants? And how can we be good ancestors? And this, this is re-indigenizing, right? Like becoming a good ancestor, thinking seven generationally about your ancestors and your descendants. And where do you come from? And where are you going? Where are your lineages going? You, you could say, um, you know, talk about seven generations. But I've heard other theories around the seven generations. Some, some people say you're in the center of your universe and you're praying for seven generations behind you and seven generations in front of you. But other people say that it's, um, it's like, an, think of an hourglass figure. So you have this, this triangle and you have your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and you're, you're in the middle. And then there's another triangle down the bottom and there's your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. That's the seven generations. So every, every action, every thought, every vibration that you're putting out, you're directly affecting your ancestors and your, your future generations. You know, it's that quantum physics of like what I'm doing now is affecting everything, be it past, past or future. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it really is for us to be here right now and, and to use, for example, water, talking about water, water as a way of, of emitting you know certain like uh frequencies or thoughts or prayers for the betterment of our both ancestors and future generations how, how can you do that a simple way a very simple way is that when you in the morning when you get up the first thing you have is a glass of water and what do you do with that glass of water you talk to the water you know talk about memory and that water has a memory you can sit by a, a, a body of water and listen you can listen and observe and just feel what that water is, you know, what that water is about. You can also take water and you can program that water. You can pray to that water. And this is proven, you know, in, for the scientific um, minds out there. It, it's proven to, to work that you can actually program this water. So I always say to my clients, you know, my coaching clients, like one of the easiest ways to re, you know, connect yourself is to do that with a glass of water is to, is to maybe do a fast, you know, like a two or, or you know, three day water fast. See what comes up in your body. You know, you're going to regenerate yourself on a cellular level. But praying with, with your water every day is really kind of channeling in, in like, what do I want to achieve today? Who do I want to be? You know, like I'm programming this, you know, this almost like computer program in front of me and I'm going to drink the, the hardware to improve the mm -hmm. software, you know, or I, the software is my, my intention and my thoughts and the, the water mm -hmm. is the hardware and I'm, I'm, I'm vitalizing my, my computer system or my, my body. So. Yeah. It's like, it's like you're, um, it's part of the, uh, it's part of the technology of biology in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's, it's the thing that is the common denominator for life. It's in everything, right? Like it's, um, it's in the air, it's in the atmosphere, right? It's, it's this sort of thing that takes all different shapes, all different states, right? So it could be solid, liquid, gas, plasma, this really versatile, crazy thing that is, um, once again, creation itself. <laughs> like the, mm -hmm. you could say the feminine aspect of, the, of creation. And then you add light to the mix from the rays of father god son that is mm. uh that is penetrating the water that is illuminating reality that is creating you know life from the void from the ether 
And we're like fish that are in water. We don't realize, right? We don't realize the role water plays for us. And so we don't think about the externalities from our farming practices and our mining tellings and our, you know, plastic pollution and in all these different things, our, our rivers are clogged and choking and mm. the arteries of the earth are clogging with our trash and the oceans, the, the great reservoirs of life, the source, <laughs> the sources of it, like you'll laugh to keep from crying. It's like they're full of trash and they're becoming less and less full of fish. You know, they're empty of fish and full of trash. It's like, mm. how is this? anything other than an abomination how is this anything other than war this is this is war on our sacred mother this is war on the sacred waters of life and where the fuck are the people who will stand against that hmm. like that's how i feel it's like why wouldn't we stand against that if we were going to pick something like and hmm. this this man in the coal mine defending the water the most sacred ancient water that's like massive that the the corporation can't see that value and they just see the coal and that's just, mm -hmm. uh, that's absolutely insanity. That's, that's a dragon we have to kill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, yeah. the advice I've been given about that stuff is just keep praying and stay close to the fire. Like every, everything will work out, you know. Um, we can keep, you know, like doing our best at the end of the day. Like I, I don't like to get wrapped up in these like climate change um fearful ways of thinking i i trust in that the planet knows what she's doing you know and there are indigenous groups that talk about that the planet is moving and she's shifting and they're called the Kogi nation from colombia recently i think yeah. it was like a year ago they went to the arctic circle and consulted you know with with her on on a spiritual level and you know, talked to the earth and found out, you know, she, she's, she's suffering and she needs to heal. So it's, it's not, it's not doomsday kind of mentality for me. It's, it's always positivity. It's, 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 you know, you, you want to be stagnant. You want to be dark. You, you get water that's full of algae and, and you can't drink it, but you want, we, we need to be flowing. We need to be water that's, you know, being kissed by sunlight. That's, that's uh, radiant and uh, clear. And when it hits an obstacle, it doesn't hit the obstacle. It goes around, it goes over, goes under, and eventually it goes through that obstacle. But we need to be like that in, in, in the way that we think, the way that we're, we're speaking our words and act and, and understand there are, there are solutions. You know, this is just a period of, of time that we're going through, and we've been through periods like this before. I think maybe just technology is um, amplifying what's going on around the world. You know, but for, for since the you know the beginning of existence there has been war you know there has been fam famine there's been disease these are things that the waves that just come cycles that happen on the planet and we just need to know how to ride those but more than ever you know we, we we need to be in nature we need to be we need to be positive you know we need to really get out of the mindset of of like it's all going to shit because i think i think it, it can, but it also, we can, we can change that, you know, we can, we can be um, the best versions of ourselves and we can do the best we can for our water supplies, for our children, the way we're thinking, you know, talk about like, you know, before like sexual energy, it's like, take care of your sexual waters. What does that mean? Like, you know, well, circulate your, your, your sexual energy in, in good ways. Um, you know, like connect more to the waterways around where you live, like learn more from indigenous people from where you live like understand ways in which we can protect the water it's, it's not about the overconsumption of it's not even an overconsumption but this this the, these theories about overconsumption of you know uh, animal protein or like beef or like fossil fuels yes that's all there 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 are contributing factors but the main thing is the poisoning of water systems you know th that's that's the main thing the planet heats up and cools down we know that it goes through cycles um but the the main thing for me is really is that water coming back to understanding and and i invite people you know listening do a fast a water fast for two days see how you feel you know like i think i think vision quest should be mandatory for for everyone to go on and, and experience like hey I, I really don't exist without this life force like i need this to be good 
Yeah, you're you brought it up. It's perfect because I was going to like, I need a vision quest. I need because I haven't actually had that initiation. <clears throat> I've I've fasted. I haven't dry fasted uh, for more than a day. Um, in my life, probably now that I think about it, you know, like it's probably been most of my life, if not all of my life that I've had water every day, you know, like I've had been able to get access to some sort of liquid to put into my mouth every day, you know? And, um, even if that was soda on some of the worst days, you know, <laughs> it's like, like back in the, back in the days when that was a thing, you know, back when I was just part of the mainstream trajectory of what everyone's doing which is drinking a shit ton of soda if you if you come to utah you'll just get waterboarded by non water by, by soda by sugar it's like yeah. um drive throughs of soda 24 like everywhere you look like they're popping up all over the place because when you repress um well it's not just this it's, it's soda's sugar's addictive right sugar's addictive and when you drink it it's just delicious and so it's auto, like you just want more and then it colonizes essentially the bacteria of your stomach adapts mm -hmm. to it and you end up with this sort of candida overgrowth and all these things where you just now have this neurology wired up the psychology that says more soda all the time and like for me right now that doesn't even sound attractive like if you paid me to drink 72 ounces of soda i'd say fuck off like it's not worth the hangover it's not worth the consequences right like mm -hmm. No, thanks. But once you're adapted to that and you can have a big gulp every day, you know, that's like, or multiple times a day, that's, that's just the consciousness of a lot of people. And when you're relating to water in that way, because what you're really drinking is water. They just added mm. a shit ton of sugar to it and some flavorings and some chemicals, some carbonation. That's it. That's it. It's water with all that other shit in it. And so it's like, why is that the thing? You're drinking a Coke. You're not drinking a water. It's not a water. It's a Coke. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, Coke commodified the water, probably stole it for some abomination of, a, of, of a, an agreement, right? Where they somehow get like, you can see these companies like Nestle that buy like millions and millions and millions of gallons of water from places like the Great Lakes where there's so much fresh water and they get it for like pennies, you know, they get it mm -hmm. for a couple hundred dollars for some sort of, you know, just sort of like this fucking crazy power play where they get all the water for nothing and then they turn it into a product that makes them billions of dollars yeah. and it's like that's that's the, the definition of profaning the sacred if there ever was one this is this is um why we as as hunter gatherers would execute people in our tribe right like that's something that you would execute someone for <laughs> you know what i mean like mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of like if you're if you're going to go against the commons that hard right if you're going to be that greedy and that um anti social it's it's like it's like a very anti social thing to do it's not collaborative at all with your environment right and with everyone else especially if your product poisons those same waters that you stole right mm -hmm. with the plastic pollution so it's like what are the consequences of this? Like where, you know what I mean? And we, we have these um, people who are fighters who are fighting, like people that you're talking to. And there's, there's been warriors protecting the waters for a long time, but we're getting to this scale where if we don't change the culture that's doing it, then all the people fighting, you know, it'll be, it'll be in vain. Like we're running out of time, right? Like, the damage going into the oceans and into the rivers and all the dammed up waterways and all this, like it's just, it's accelerating forward. It's not slowing down as far as I can tell. Um, but I, I don't know anything. Like, I don't know what, where, what's really happening. You know, and I just know that if you go to Asia, Southeast Asia, you'll get depressed <laughs> about, about the state of the water, right? If you go to the sandblast islands in the middle of the Caribbean, you'll get depressed because the trash that's washing up on the beaches that are pristine that humans don't even live on. Mm. And, it, you know, even if you go to Maui, where it's like sacred water, and it washes up onto the black lava beach, and as it washes away, you see a line of microplastics from the receding wave. Even in that sacred water, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the Pacific. And this is what we're doing. And so it's like, I'm really, you know, I'm I'm 100% down to do this vision quest. I've been waiting for the right opportunity. I would love nowhere else to go and do this than uh, in Colombia, Eagle Condor Alliance. 
So whenever you guys are hosting the next one, please let me know and I will try to make it happen. Um, because I would love the support and the intention behind it. I need, I need someone to initiate me. I need someone to show me the way and show me the ropes. Like you guys have already done in many ways with how I can relate to the fire and relate to the water and relate to the sacred and bringing the, the baby, saving the baby out of the bathwater that I threw out when I tossed out religion, which was the sacred. And mm -hmm. you can't forget that. And mm -hmm. I've been able to then cultivate that um, in the float tank and, and in, with my own spiritual practice and not just in the float tank, but that is where I, I would call the Holy of Holies. That's where I'd call the inner sanctum where you can go all the way in and, and it, it's, of course, it's through the water. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these, these ways it's, it's healing by fire and water. Yeah. It, it's as simple as that. And talking about, um, the vibrations of, of water, there's, you know, ceremonies where we pray over water and people drink that water and that water can heal you. And it's a, <clears throat> there's a masculine water and there's a feminine water. So there's a, a, a man that prays over that water and there's a woman that prays over that, the other water. And, it's it's a huge part of life, and it's a huge part of these ceremonial kind of ways is is water, and I think yeah, definitely vision quests, and you know, there's uh, there's vision quests a lot of in a lot of places. Yeah, people people can have access to them, but a good way is just you know, even before that, is just doing it like dry fasting you know, for two days and just seeing seeing how you feel, like what what comes up. Uh, understanding you know the necessity of, of that that water and just need, we, we really need to slow it down you know slow things down slow the mind down slow slow our bodies down slow everything down and we don't need a new iphone every year like you know like we don't need to produce that every year why don't we just produce something that's that works for three or four years and every three or four years there's a new model come out or it's just this as you're saying at the beginning this race to the bottom and just yeah, there needs to be a a, a really uh, deep change in mindset in society, <clears throat> and I think that you know me and you don't have the answers for that, and uh, that's that's something that will just play out. But I just I trust in 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 the way of uh, the Creator and the way of this this Earth that you know we're just we're going along how we're meant to be going along and, and it's, it's all going to be, it's all going to be good, but we just need to get up and, you know, chop wood, carry water every day and, and be present and help our, our families and just do the best we can. I, I love how that, that mantra for like a Zen saying of, of basically just like be in the now and live now, like, and the saying is chop wood, carry water. Both of those things are what we've been talking to like fire and water. Chop yeah. the wood for the fire and mm -hmm. carry the water to drink because that is life, right? Like that is, that is the, the sacred right there in that one, in that one little, that one little uh, parable. But at, the same, but at the same time, it's this parable that's talking about before enlightenment, enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop mm -hmm. wood, carry water. So it's like you realize that when you're awakened and when you're enlightened that the point is to chop the wood and carry the water. Right. Like there's this sort of, uh, like I said before, this thing that's happening of its own accord. It's like the nature of it. It's just, it's just the happening of consciousness. Oh, and also, also you're, you're breathing oxygen and you're on the earth. So you're, mm -hmm. the elementals are all there. You're yeah. Before and after enlightenment, you know, you, you stay connected to the elements always. Yeah. Well said. And, and, um, to your point about, not ours to figure out. I don't, I would, I would say it's not just ours to figure out, mm. but I would also say that it is ours to figure out as a species because we, um, have the power of gods, whether we like it or not, that mm. is what we're carrying around with our black box full of technologies and our AI overlords that we're summoning, right? Like the, this is, this is actually ours to figure out. And if we don't figure it out, it's going to be really bad for us. And yeah. probably for all the other life. So it's like, we have to, um, you know, I'm with you. I'm not the doomer shit for sure. And I fell, mm. I fell into that pretty hard. I, I went down into an existential risk, grab a hole for 
well, I'm still in the rabble hole. <laughs> like, so to say that, like there's, cause there's, there's, there's a, there's a lot going on, but at the same time, my disposition towards it shifted a lot in the last, I don't know, year or so. And it, um, it's, it's like, it's all about children, really. Mm. It's the sacred waters, your sacred waters. And when you're, when you are in the consciousness of my sacred waters are going to flow and, and I'm going to allow that flow, which by the way, this came to me in the water, in the flow tank. This was my, this was my healing of sort of my own damned up sacred water, so to speak, mm. because I didn't want to have children in an apocalyptic world. You know, mm. I didn't want to have, I didn't want to send my children to the Mad Max future, the water war future. You know, I didn't, I didn't want that. And I'm like, well, fuck, is that what's coming? <laughs> you know, it looks like it. I don't want that shit. And so at the same time, you know, connecting to the spirit of of life itself, of water, is the spirit of flow. And structure and flow go together. And, mm. you know, the actual water itself is this ultimate symbol of flow is structured. It's got these sort of molecular bonds with hydrogen and oxygen. It's, there's, there's a molecular structure to it. And, you know, it can change temperatures and the structure of it changes, right, to different states. But it, the emergent property of that structure is flow. And there's this polarity that goes together and we are structured water. We are water that's been structured with biological, you know, uh, skeletal systems and muscles, and we can walk around we're, we're bodies of water moving across the earth. And it's like this, um, flow has to flow. And if it doesn't flow, it stagnates. And this is, um, true of, the hydrological cycle, right? And what happens when you dam up the rivers and the salmon can't run? You know, mm -hmm. what happens to the entire fucking ecosystems, both up and downstream of the river? You know what I mean? It's like you're, you're fucking with really old systems, really old complexity that's mm -hmm. really integrated and really uh, dependent on everything around it. Like it's all woven together. So we don't even think about the externalities. We don't think about the externalities of, of our pornography addictions, right? And what that's going to do, or our our sugar addictions, or any of these things that are having an impact on fertility, you know, yeah. and our flow of the sacred waters of life. And so, it was it was actually some sort of like vision, uh, beautiful experience in a float tank that I was I experienced the sort of undamming or the flow of my own my own sacred waters, and I felt as that it was like the vision was almost like you know like a like a dandelion, right? Mm -hmm. And it has all of these seeds. And mm -hmm. that's what kind of like what a dandelion like looks like. It's like iconic. And then the wind just sort of like blows all the seeds everywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. And there was something about that. And I, I thought about that on the macro scale. And I thought about humanity just like evolving into this sort of coherent species, this globally coherent species that's stewarding the rock well. And then the panspermia that comes from that, like the dandelions just blowing off into the cosmic wind, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, there was like something beautiful about that. And, and I connected to that future and immediately the have children problem got solved for me, you know, because that's what it is. Those are my children going off into space, you know, mm -hmm. going off into to, to maybe hopefully not colonize in like some sort of hardcore extractive sense, but to bring... Um, evolved life to more of the cosmos, you know, and to continue the, the unique self symphony of like what's happening with the, um, with the emergent complexity that is, that is God, that is reality. And it's like, it's beautiful. And to participate in that and to be intimate with it and to allow God to create through you, not just with children, but like with your creative energy, like what mm -hmm. is, so when you say it's not ours to solve, I would, I would push back and say, it's deeply ours to solve. There is something that is uniquely yours to solve. And it's not the whole show. It's not, it's like you have to be the savior that solves all the problems or that saves the world like Jesus when he returns and everything will be all groovy all of a sudden, mm -hmm. right? But we need to save hundreds of billions of dollars for him, you know, the Mormon church. They're just like, they're like hoarding, they're like hoarding so much money, so much wealth because, of, because Jesus is going to need it when, they, when he comes back. <laughs> so. Yeah. Anyways, so I so rant about that is over. But the the point the point being, if there's a point, it's that um, how how we relate 
to water is is everything. And for me, my mission, part of a big part of my unique sort of responsibility or sacred obligation or whatever you want to call it, like what is mine to do, seems to involve the water. And it seems to be about creating sacred architecture for the stewardship of sacred waters for the healing of our people. Because our people are dying. Our people need healing. And it's both in the cold water and it's in the beautiful, warm float water. And it's in the sacred spring water, like, you know, the, the, the hot springs, like doing it in nature would be optimal, right? Mm. Not just in, in, inside of a city, inside of a, a box with the water that comes out of the, the pipes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how can we get to, you know, well, I have a beautiful place in mind, in my home, in, in my, in my home country, which is like my home territory, which is the birthplace of sacred water. Um, in a place called Water Canyon. And this is, this is where I want to bring the temple of water and, and fire and steward the fire as well, all the elements. But because but the sacred fire and the, and the sweat lodge or the sauna or however, however you interface with connecting to the fire, you know, that's also something that we forgot how to steward. And so mm. I, um, <laughs> I guess part of this project in, in terms of the podcast component of it is learning and it's connecting with these uh these lineages and these currents of wisdom that have been unbroken like you're talking about uh, you know elders in australia you've spoken to and uh, in colombia you've spoken to and the kogi that are there i mean you, you know you've met simon right was was mm -hmm. yeah you've met simon yeah. he was uh came to a retreat you were there yeah and he's he's been doing a lot of work in colombia with um he's actually working with the kogi and they're trying to get to some sort of bioregional stewardship um, mm -hmm. in some sort of decentralized way that that um, is a win win and and that has a strong place for the indigenous that live there, you know, mm -hmm. like where it's where it's in co creation with them. Yeah. Um, there's some really beautiful things happening in the Sierra Nevada down in Colombia. People are being called there to the heart of the world. Yeah, that's that's cool that um, he's doing that work. You know, like a lot of people have come and had to plant medicine and found a more conscious way of doing their part, you know. And I think, you know, what we were talking about before about it's not ours to figure it, figure it out, but, but it is. And I think what what is our responsibility to figure out is our contribution. It's not the, the the greater picture, you know, or the 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 where we're going, but we're on focusing on the day to day. Like you're saying, you can get really lost in the doomsday kind of what if, what's it all, what's going to happen. But bringing back the simplicity of life of being here right now in the present and doing your part. And there's a a, a myth that, or you know, a, a mythology story that comes out of. Colombia, which talks about a, a, a huge fire that's happening in the jungle and all the animals are filing out and they're going the opposite direction, obviously, to escape this fire. And the jaguar is the last, you know, being like that, the king of the, the jungle, um, is the last animal out and he's just this hummingbird kind of comes zooming down the, the river bank and pick up a, a droplet of water from the river and it goes, the hummingbird goes as close as it can to the to the fire and just kind of throws that that droplet of water in the fire and zips back and this the jaguar is just continually observing this hummingbird going back and forth and he comes back to the to the river and the the jaguar kind of yells out and he's like well what are you doing and he's like well i'm, I'm trying to put the fire out and uh the, the jaguar is like well you're you're not going to do that with a drop of water and he's like i know but i'm doing my part and it's 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 a good teaching you know about the self responsibility that we have every day of we don't have to figure everything out on a global level but we can figure it out internally and within our in our in our own world and with our children and we can do good deeds that may seem insignificant but you know in the long run they're very significant and that's taking care of the way we're thinking the words we're using the the water our relationship with nature 
Um, yeah. Yeah. Our relationship with fire. Yeah, you know, these simple things they they grow. They're seeds. We're planting them. You know, you're not going to get, you're not going to harvest food straight away. You have to wait. You have to tend to it. It takes time, but with time, we're able to to reap the rewards. And and yeah, it just does that old adage of uh, chop wood, carry water. Yeah, yeah. You you'll never finish the work, but you're not excused from it either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. 100%, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you know, a hoe, man. I I I really resonate with um with you know everything that you've been up to that I've, that I've seen you been, you know, doing, um, from Eagle Condor Alliance to the, you know, the stuff that you're doing now with, with coaching and with your, your, um, you know, your business with supplements and whatnot. And, you know, this project, like this podcast that you're doing is really cool because Mm -hmm. I think that it's, it's like you said, with seeds, it's planting seeds. And these are little artifacts that are little seeds that can then hopefully find fertile soil and, the hearts of the people listening, you know, mm-hmm. and they've certainly found, you know, my heart in terms of the the wisdom that I'm trying to both cultivate in on a personal level, like with, for example, going on a water fast and doing um, using using uh, something so simple that's the best reminder to bring me back down to reality, back down to earth, and to back down to what is important. And what mm-hmm. is sacred, and um, and then going from there, you know, like trying to continue uh, weaving in more and more of these, uh, I guess, practices in 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 the right sort of rhythm, in the right sort of sequence, or whatever, you know, from my Sabbath practice, my weekly sort of reset and recenter to you know bigger initiations like the Vision Quest that I still would love to go on, and I want to say one last thing about baptism just because i should have mentioned it earlier which you know it's, i'd be remiss not to mention it which is just that baptism isn't just about in the mormon faith it's not just about initiating a boy or a girl into a, the army of jesus or into the church right mm. it's also for the remission of sins so it's also washing away your sort of sins mm. you know and you're clean as you leave the baptismal font you've been you've been like renewed you're cleaned you're spiritually cleaned you're purified you're cleansed so even even there is a remnant of this magic of water of the regenerative capacity for it and the cleansing aspect of it unfortunately mormonism doesn't really worship water in the same way um in fact there's some really weird scriptures from the founder joseph smith about water basically being sort of the ground for Satan or for like, you know, basically having this component of chaos to it and this component of darkness to it, you know? So it's kind of like be like, like it's, it doesn't paint water in the light of the sacred goddess. That's for sure. Mm. And um, yeah. So anyways, I just, I, I felt like um, there's something about floating for me that is almost like that, you know, it, it, mm-hmm. not almost, it certainly is. It's certainly the place to wash away your sins, right? Because it's like, where do your sins come up? <laughs> like when you're alone with yourself, right? Like yeah. if you have a conscience and there's something on your conscience, like there's something that won't go away, you're going to meet it in the float tank. Ultimately, if you keep floating, especially if you do it with intention, like if you do it with an intention to heal and to discover what it is that you need to let go over heal, um, the water will certainly take that. The water can certainly hold that, and it can certainly add a purifying, regenerative practice to your life. And so with you know cold plunging, with floating, with getting out into nature and getting into rivers and lakes, like all this is so purifying for me. I mean, obviously mm-hmm. drinking pure water from a spring is a huge upgrade, you know. Uh, unfortunately, mine's put in bottles and then sent from the mountains to Las Vegas, you know what I mean? So it's like... I mean, big bottles, but still, it's like um, refillable bottles. <laughs> like, please don't yeah. buy Costco water, fucking pallets of plastic. It's <laughs> insane. It's insane. Yeah. I can't believe I ever did that. But is there, um, I know we're kind of at time, so I'm just going to ask you this. Like, is there anything um, else that you would like to, you know, leave with whoever's listening um, who might be looking to potentially or is curious about, you know, re-indigenizing or rewilding? Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, like, don't, don't be too hard on yourself. 
um, these these ways take time. You know, you're not going to figure it out all in one go. But try new things. You know, try a light a fire. Just go sit by a fire outside on a mountain. Go camping. Be by a body of water. Just see how it feels. You know, I'm I'm not here to tell people this is the way and this is how you do it. But whatever feels right to you, you know. But but take your time in um, in connecting, the listening in. You know, and 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 it's not it's not just for you. It's it's for for everyone. It's for your mental health, for your overall like well being to feel good. You know, and that has a rippling effect in your family and. For those who have children, it's a rippling effect into them. And what are you showing them? You know, it's about passing on these these traditions and good ways to to the next generation. And I think more than anything, I think it's you know it's developing your own way, but also like finding indigenous elders that are still practicing the cultural ways and listen to them. But really, listen to them. You know. Um, if you can find those communities and you can respectfully like enter those communities in a very respectful way and not demanding something and just kind of be there and maybe you'll learn a thing or two that will you know benefit your life and something that you can pass on to the next generation which is going to be a lot more beneficial to them than, than you'll ever know so yeah it's really for me more than anything it's it's listening listening to the water and listening to those uh those communities and those elders. Beautiful. And I just want to say thank you for being a bridge for me to get access to um, that sort of community and that sort of tradition. And um, because it's definitely scarce or in short supply from where I, where I come from, but um, I'm going to try to be more, I guess, rigorous about searching for it here because Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, I'm sure I'll find it. I'm sure that it's here. Um, even if I have to drive a little bit, it's it's worth it, you know, to go sit in a sweat lodge. Yeah, definitely. Those those communities are there, you know, and people go there with the right intentions and the right mindset and go there to, to help and to learn and to listen and you know, think things can open up over time. So uh what what is the um cutting edge for you right now? Like what are you working on and when what can people look forward to? Yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm doing a few things. Um, first of all, I have my my podcast and newsletter on Substack called The Way of Life, so you can follow me there. And I do a lot of you know writings about teachings I've learned and interviews with Indigenous elders from, from around the world. Uh, you can also follow me on Instagram at Bobby Wade Official. That's my handle, and uh, I do a lot of coaching, and I coach people around these ways of reconnecting themselves. So I take people a lot of um, you know, let's say, you know, people that are just kind of living in this modern life and, and just on the on the hamster wheel and kind of take them out of that and, and show them you can still live in a modern world, but you can have ancestral teachings. So it's, you know, ancestral teachings in a modern world and helping people reconnect to nature, understand who they are, like where they come from, their ancestors, you know, where they are right now and practices they can use and just kind of giving them that, um, you could say, a uh, true north direction you know in life and, and helping them you know reorganize those things and, and be more present for themselves for their family and mental health um that sounds like something that i would be really stoked about like to check out because um right now i'm in this chapter of my life where i'm like reordering so to speak right like mm-hmm. there's been the kind of chaos burned down like fire phase that's kind of burned down my sacred cows right and like my dreams and my visions of like what i thought i wanted you know and um like the whole my whole sense of what is going on in the world right you know there's sort of like there's this frame of like pre-tragic tragic tragic, and post-tragic so this idea that you know you're sort of naive in the world in the pre-tragic sort of paradisical you know sort of eden of life where you're a child in the garden you know and you haven't awakened to the sort of metal reality, so to speak, or maybe you've insulated yourself from it, or you have a story that protects you from facing the hard truth. And then mm-hmm. there's the initiation. There's a sort of like trial or whatever, where you face the hard truth, where it you kind of comes crashing over you. And it's kind of like a, you might call it for some people, like an existential crisis or, um, you know, this nihilism is sort of like 
often associated with the tragic, you know what I mean? Phase mm -hmm. where you're, where you're so numb to it because of, of just the intensity or the scope and the scale or whatever it is. And so I'm, I'm in this work of trying to move into post tragic and into a, um, what would you say? Like, a a more integrated perspective, like you were pointing to about doesn't have to be all doom and gloom and we can actually have radical hope for the future and we can be living uh, joyfully now, you know, like in living in um, a state of a higher frequency of, of our own pleasure, like our own um, desire, like where we're actually creating the reality that we want to live in and handing that forward, you know, mm -hmm. like that's the trajectory of our, of our sacred water and our creative energy and our lineages and our, you know, like that's our North star is, is our regenerative cult culture that leads to the more beautiful world that we know is possible. You know, like this is for me, it's the beauty way. And, mm. um, you know, to, to recognize the beauty of life and then add to the beauty of life. And, uh, as, as Daniel Schmachtenberger says, increase your capacity to do both. Right. Like, and so I would love to increase my capacity to, to walk the beauty way and to, um, bring more, more of that ancestral wisdom into my life. And so that I can be more of a channel for that and more of an amplification of that into the culture. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to weave together the right the, part of this, what this project is with this podcast right now and with art drop and, um, this, this other, uh, project that that is partnering on this podcast now and is is helping me produce this and is um sort of giving me more of a platform and helping me and, and then I'm in return also super super fired up for what they're doing because they're using art to to seed the more beautiful world so mm -hmm. it's a meme factory so to speak it's like we need new myths, memes, and metaphors. We need art because art shifts consciousness and culture. And mm -hmm. art is like the tip of the spear for culture. So where are the visionary artists? And so this podcast is a call for visionary artists and visionaries of all kinds, not just fine artists, but the fine artists for some reason have been in large part left out of the picture, right? Like a lot of starving artists. And so how can we bring flow to that? How can we bring economic flow into uh, and, and democratizing art, like liberating art, you know, mm -hmm. and making it so that it pays to be an artist. And it's actually, um, it's, it's, you're empowered to step into your sovereignty and your creativity. So all that is to say, that's kind of what I'm, that's kind of my North star right now. And I see weaving in this, the story, the superstructure, which is upstream of all of it. Like I had a conversation with, um, Mark Gaffney recently on the podcast, and he um, he's in the business of of writing a new story, of thinking about a world religion or a world philosophy story that is something that we can all sort of um, orient to in some sense, or like have a common denominator. And I think that like it's great to dive deep into the weeds with deep philosophy and, and mysticism, and and you know he's he's an amazing academic and a wordsmith and a, and a, and a, a, a rabbi, you know what I mean? He's a, he's, he's a fascinating human and I'm absolutely stoked to have all those types of conversations. But if it came down to just a one word common denominator, it's super simple. It's agua, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's water <laughs> and it's, that's it. That's the common denominator. Right. And so, you know, regenerative water art, like how do we bring the the consciousness of our culture into alignment with water mm -hmm. as the goddess and water as the sacred mother and water as the birthplace of all life and how can we bring you experien experientially into the profundity of water with mm -hmm. the float tank and deep altered states of consciousness or expanded states of mind where you can actually drop into the knowing, into the gnosis of what the water knows and what you know as an extension of the water, what you already know deep in your bones, you know, like deep in your DNA, deep in whatever you want to call what we are. Like that is, there is truth in that. There's truth in that exploration of the self, of the psyche, of the soul. And so building these um, regenerative centers, uh, eudaimonia centers, or like architecture for the healing of our 
people and the discovery of who we, who we ought to be, who we are, mm-hmm. who we could be, you know, who we're becoming and aligning that, you know, towards true North, whatever that, whatever that is like resonating on the inside. So if you can assist me in any way in, in sort of making sure that the, I'm not missing anything and that the most important components of the, um, the re-indigenizing or the, the animistic way of relating to life or however you want to call it, like whatever, whatever you want to call that wisdom. Um, I need to make sure that we're representing it here with this microphone. And, and I'm trying to, um, amplify that, that prayer. Oh, thanks man. Yeah. Appreciate that word. And it's good work, you know, good work, what you're doing. 100%. Thank you. Hope to uh, hope to talk to you soon again, man. Thank you, bro. Hey guys, Christian here. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Bobby Wade. And I once again just want to encourage you to check out the Way of Life on Substack. Links in the description. But it is it's phenomenal. His interviews with Indigenous elders are expansive and really important. And um, you know, all everything that Bobby's up to, I'm I'm really really stoked about. So. If you're feeling called to it, check out his course, Rediscovering Ancestral Wisdom in Modern Times. It's also linked in the description. And check out the uh, show notes as well for links to our sponsors if you want to support this project with the Lumi Gummies, if you're interested in some organic cannabis, or through Art Drop if you want to support human-made art and get some incredible visionary art shipped to you as a 3D replica. Um, and we have all of our other links in the description as well. So until next time, much love, and I will try to be more diligent about regularly publishing and releasing episodes for this project. Ciao.